tonight. On the Midnight Train podcast, we take a ride to San Jose, California, and no, not for a Sharks game, but to visit the Winchester Mansion, the obscure house built out of misery and despair. Warning, we say things like, the Browns made the Steelers cry. Haha. <laughs> and who writes this shit, anyway? All aboard. Hello, passengers, and welcome to the Midnight Train Podcast, where we bring the dark to light. What's that mean? Well, you motherfuckers know what that means. We make fun of and joke about creepy shit while bringing you as much information on each topic as possible. I am your host, the conductor of the cryptic, Jonathan Sayer. And with me, as always, it's it's Mr. Moody. Hello, hello. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm... Uh... This is our first uh, first show as a uh, two piece. Yeah, it is. So that's interesting. It is our first show as a two piece. It's weird. I mean, we've done it before, but it's just it's weird. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right. As uh, this is our first show without uh, without old Jeff yeah. being with us. <laughs> but that's okay. Jeff's on doing other things. He's taking care of his family and responsibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And good for him. Good stuff for him. like that. And so. here I am missing my daughter's hockey game. Yes. See, <laughs> see, but priorities, Moody. But like we said, I'm not there, and she's got a hat trick already. My wife said, maybe you should just not go ever that's- again. Probably the best idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you should just. I'm gonna, that's gonna be my excuse anyway. Yeah, you should just. Yeah, I need to take her to a hockey game. She sucks when I'm there, <laughs> which is so much better when I'm not there. <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, you beautiful bunch of dark passengers know that we're just a couple of musicians and assholes that love history and cannot get enough of the mysterious, and we want you all to know how much it means to us that you're listening to us at this very moment. Your reviews and support really do make all the hard work worthwhile. And saying that, please stop over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now. And if you can give us a five-star review, please do so. It helps for some fucking reason. They say it helps. I don't know. Apparently. We have been getting quite a... We got a new review. We've got a, a, a few, actually. We no, got we got a few? few. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And it's awesome that people do that. It's just, it seems weird that a lot of people just, they're like, meh, I'll listen to the show. Well, we got uh, the one said that they were a, a Time Suck listener. Yes, and they, they actually came from Time Suck, which time, is amazing. From somewhere, I don't know where they, whatever. But. Yeah, he, uh, it was uh, the, um, on the forum for Time Suck, because I'm a huge fan of Dan Cummins yeah. and Time Suck over there. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm on the forum, and someone mentioned something about the Denver airport. And I was like, oh, you know, we did a oh, sweet episode okay. on that. Cool, cool. And the guy was like, you know, what do you, what do you mean we? And I'm like, oh, my podcast. I'm, I wasn't trying to promote or anything like that. No, you know, right. I'm just like, yeah, you know, I have a podcast. I'm like, you know, we're nowhere near where Time Suck is. <laughs> Dan no. Cummins is. No, no, no. I was like, but I'd love to hear him do it. And he's like, oh, well, maybe I'll check it out. Next thing you know, he checks it out and he listens. And, yeah, and, awesome. and he says it, it's very funny. So thank you, sir, very much for that. We if you're listening to this one, salutations, my friend. <laughs> salutations to you, <laughs> young man. For uh, Spread doing the word if you can, if you like it that much. Spread the we word. Would appre- we would appreciate that. So. Yeah, yeah. let people know, you know, if, if you're into it. I mean, yeah. Which you obviously seem to be because you actually took the time to. <laughs> Listen and write. And yeah, because, I mean, it's, it's like I said uh, before, you know, pe- we have listeners all across the globe and it's just uh it seems that most people either don't use apple i've noticed again we talked about oh, we've been getting a lot of a lot of spotify listeners. Spot, spotify is all over the place and uh yeah it's just uh yeah, it's it, i have it up right here it says great funny a fan of time suck podcast recommend this podcast while talking about denver airport very nice yeah cool so very thank you nice. thank you very much thank you very much yeah, appreciate that but yeah it's uh it's just weird because you know I don't know, Spotify, you can't really rate. Or yeah, they, like they're that. like one of the only ones. Like, I know iHeartRadio, you can rate. Uh, Stitcher, you can rate. Um, obviously, Apple Podcasts, you can rate. But Spotify doesn't have like a rating system. Right, and it seems to be the one that people listen the most. That's what so, I use. Whatever. You can always, you know, send us an email and say, hey, you guys really don't suck that bad. I just, so what I do, I noticed we had that, remember how I told you that was kind of weird? We had that midweek boost of listeners that mm-hmm. we don't normally get. It's yeah. because what I did was I went on while I was at working Tuesday and Wednesday, and I just put the podcast on repeat just to boost our list. Oh, so that was all you? Yeah. Yeah. It was all me. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate that. I listened to it like 13 times. That's awesome. Yeah. That's good. So, 
I hope you're kidding. I, I am definitely kidding. Okay, good. I can't, like, I can't stand to hear myself I'm talk like, that much. son of a bitch. <laughs> but listen, you guys can literally leave any review you'd like. Uh, like I said before, you can also find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, by typing the Midnight Train Podcast in their search bar and clicking the follow button. You'll then get each episode as they are released. And Patreon subscribers will be getting a The Day the Music Died bonus episode. You still haven't given them that? Uh, not yet. I wanted to wait till today. <laughs> you know why I wanted to wait till today? Why is that? Because it's Betty White's 99th fucking birthday it is it is it is and by the time we're recording by the time you're listening to this it won't be but today sunday is her birthday correct and it is also i'm putting it out there the day the browns beat the chiefs baby boom boom it's going to happen so tomorrow when you're hearing this you're either going to be laughing because i'm an idiot (laughs) or you heard it from me first we're gonna win we're gonna win by I'm, I'm calling. I'm going to call it three points. We're going to. It's a close one. Three points. It's a squeaker. Wow. We're going to. We're going to edge it out at the end. We're you know where we uh, the the spread on the game is ten points. Oh my god, that's ridiculous. <laughs> It's 10 points. <laughs> I haven't heard anybody say that that's a good spread either. Everyone's like, dude, why are they such an underdog? Yeah. Like, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's fine. We got this. Oh, we yeah. got this. Yeah. And if you're not from Cleveland and you're not a uh, Browns fan, well, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Right? Oh my god! <laughs> I'm kidding. Obviously, everyone has to have their own team. I actually watched the Ravens lose last a, night. How can you not be a Browns fan? Especially now, right? You kind of have to, unless be a you're fan. in Kansas City. Unless, yeah, and even then, you're kind of like or well, Pittsburgh. But fuck Pittsburgh. It'd be so. kind of nice to see them, you yeah. know, to see the Browns do something. Yeah. I mean, listen, Mahomes is a beast. Oh, absolutely. He is. That entire team Dude, is. Gotta, but I did find out that Sammy Watkins is out, so one of their top receivers is out. That's good. I think their uh, their main running back might be out too. Not good as in like he's hurt or whatever, but well, that, good for that us. gives us a chance. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I did also hear that uh, the Browns are at full strength since Fuck our yeah. second game in yeah. the season. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which just goes to show you how awesome the season was. Yeah. Well, <laughs> all I could keep hoping is, is that the, uh, our, our first string don't come in there and fuck it up for us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, cause obviously the second string guys were doing something good. So anyway, yeah, hopefully you guys will listen to this and the Browns won and I'm in a great mood. Happy birthday, Betty White. Yeah. And happy birthday, Betty White. But I you know, know she's be, an avid listener of the yeah, show. So I, I can only hope that would be if, if, that if would two be people in this world would listen to this podcast, I could die a happy man. It's Betty White yeah. and Bill Murray. <laughs> If Bill Murray and Betty White could listen, I'd be so fucking happy. That'd be awesome. I would literally die a happy man. You think we have any celebrity listeners out there? I don't know. Possibly. I think that'd be cool if we did. That'd be awesome. If you're a celebrity and you listen to this, first of all, we don't know why. But second of all, (laughs) let us know. We'd like to know. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for listening. We'd like to know what you do so we can support you and your endeavors as well. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody, so anyway, it goes you, for anybody. Right. It, well, that's true. It, it does go after anybody. Yeah. Like uh, last night was the uh, Critic City uh, live stream. Yes, it was. And um, I got to watch a little bit of it via somebody else watching it. Okay. Okay. Only because I was watching the game. Oh, watch the Ravens. Yeah, they did Ravens lose. Bills. Thank and, God for that. Yeah. Um, it, I, dude, they held Lamar Jackson <laughs> to shit. three fucking points. And then they gave him a concussion. <laughs> did he actually get a concussion? Yeah. Oh, when he hit the ground when and in hit, the end zone? In the end zone, he went back and he got a concussion. And who was that dude that ran 102 yard <sighs> run from the end zone to end zone that in that incredible. interception? That, that was, was incredible. F- fucking wild. Anyway, this is not a sports podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just very excited we're, about it. So now that Jeff's not here, we're changing it up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. We're talking sports. <laughs> That's right. No, I'm just kidding. As much as that would be awesome. But you if you know, want those bonuses, I'm sorry, good. Oh, no, go ahead. You're no. good. You're good. Well, if you want those bonuses, sign up over at patreon.com forward slash the midnight train podcast or head over to the midnight train podcast.com. And at the very top of the page, you'll see Patreon. Just click on that. And listen, you get some cool merchandise and it's, uh, you know, you get all kinds of bonus material. For five bucks. You get bonus episodes for five bucks a month. It's not yeah. even $5 per episode. No. We try month. to spit them out as much as we can. And now we're going to be doing it even more because we're like, focused in and we're doing this right moody right yeah right <laughs> what he said <laughs> i'm already working on the next day of the music diet so we got that going nice so we got another one of those coming up and we got a couple just a bunch of different shit so make yeah. sure you guys are signing up plus listen a lot of you guys out there know that we do have a lot of fun on our official facebook group page so uh, make sure you guys are going on there and it's just uh what is it the what is it called the face or midnight, midnight train, train official group forum something it's just look <laughs> for it you'll find it i don't even is it bad that we don't even know yeah i don't know and jeff will be on there from time to time because he pops up he's been on there he's been on there more now yeah <laughs> well because he's got more time in his fucking hands so many yeah make sure you guys are doing that too now listen let's turn down the lights we have a great episode coming up adjust our seats yes, have a good one? yeah grab a drink yeah 
and let's get spooky. Okay. But first, here's a toast to all of you. Uh. That's baby making music. That's baby making music. Oh. This is for the Browns because we know they won. You like that? That's right. That's a little soul searching right there. Yeah, that's that's what that good. is. That's like soul, that soul searching. That's a good one. It was like sexiness. <laughs> Things might get start getting weird around here, Moody. It's just me and you with that kind of music. And technically, we are a couple now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Our beards would just be too uncomfortable. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So today's episode examines the life of an eccentric, possibly mentally ill woman and the incredible house that she built. We'll talk about possible hauntings impossible architecture and the delusion of a heartbroken woman we are discussing sarah winchester in what some less than creative people have dubbed the winchester mystery house Ooh. That, that's the guy that bought it he's a kind of a jerk actually yeah yeah fun <laughs> so what we're going to be doing is literally I mean, obviously a lot of people out there have heard this story before right but we're going to do it our way and i think yeah. it's a fantastic story because i mean it's literally a woman who just she was distraught and started losing her shit. So I gotta say, um, I, I looked. There was tons and tons and tons of podcasts on this subject, right? Yeah. Most of them were between fifteen minutes and forty-five minutes long, and it was the the basic stuff that you hear all the time, right? I only listen. I listened to several of them, and I believe I could be mistaken because obviously I couldn't listen to all of them. We are the only ones that have the bombshell at the end. Ooh, you hear that? Where's the dun-dun-dun on that? Uh, I believe it is right there. So, and it's crazy because I didn't know. Oh, well, look at that. I didn't know. I just kind of went along with everything, and we'll see. uh, We'll see at the end. It's something a little different that I haven't heard from anybody else, so. Nice. Well, her birth name. Either means we're wrong, (laughs) or. uh, (laughs) Which, Which probably means we're wrong. Or. We got the jump, man. Nice. Well, her birth name was Sarah Lockwood Party, and no, she was not related to Flint Lockwood, just so you know. Flint Lockwood. Is that, what was that? Uh, uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? Is that what it is? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It was Mr. T, Flint, Flint Lockwood. Yeah, sorry. No, she was not. <laughs> she was the fifth of seven children born to Leonard Party and Sarah Burns. There are no existing records or, or any form of actual factual information to establish Sarah's date of birth. Even the year remains unknown. The scarce information that survives from the historical record indicates her birth must have occurred somewhere between 1835 and 1845, which is... Isn't that weird? That's that's a very (laughs) large... Yeah, that's a large gap there. I don't know about that. (laughs) She could be 90 or she could be 80. We, you know what I mean? Well, she's dead now. Well, she's dead now. I'm saying at that time is what I was saying. (laughs) So speaking of, at the time of Sarah's birth, the parties were a respectable upper middle class New Haven family. And that's Connecticut, correct? New Haven? Uh, yes, and yes. that's party, P-A-R-D-E, not party, like we're having a party. My girl wants to party all the time, mm. party all the time. Not that kind of party. Okay. It would be a lot well, cooler if it was. Song, yeah. Dude, Eddie Murphy, fuck yeah, yeah. that's a great song. <laughs> so her uh, her father, Leonard, was a uh, joiner by trade who shrewd, uh, shrewd sense of business, found him moving up the ladder of polite society as a successful carriage manufacturer. Later during mm. the Civil War, he made a fortune supplying ambulances to the Union Army, which is pretty fucking cool. <laughs> Probably needed a shitload of them, yeah. too. <laughs> so were they the it's old school? It's a lucrative business, were dude. Were they the old school ones with like a horse and buggy kind of thing? I would assume so. Yeah, they'd have to be, right? I mean, they didn't have engines, really. Yeah. Just a little dude in the front pulling it. <laughs> Get in the back. You know? <laughs> As he's so, it was, all it was was a carriage that would set ambulance on the side. Right. Probably. That's probably all it was. So young Sarah's most distinguishing characteristic was that she was uh, everything but ordinary. She was a child prodigy, a fire starter. No, just kidding. Uh, By all accounts, she was also considered to be quite beautiful. By the age of 12, Sarah was already fluent in the the Latin, French, Spanish, and Italian languages. Furthermore, her knowledge of the classics, most notably Homer, and no, not Simpson, and Shakespeare, along with a remarkable talent (laughs) uh, as a musician, was well noticed. It is no wonder that New Haven society would eventually dub her the Belle of New Haven. So she's Little Miss Elite. Yeah, really. Fuck her, dude. I know. She's so good. <laughs> <laughs> like everything. Look at me. I know how to do everything. <laughs> in addition to Sarah's brilliance and respectable place in society, there were several factors about New Haven that presented a unique influence on her upbringing. To begin with, um, there was Yale University, originally known as Yale College. From its inception, Yale and New Haven was a hub of progressive Freemasonic 
Ah, Rosicrucian thinking and activity. By the way, we'll most definitely be taking a ride on the Freemasons one of these days. It's something Would we that be to... a free ride? Come on, take, take it, it easy. Ride. Free ride. <laughs> take it easy. No, that's that's <laughs> slow ride. That's fog hat. Fuck my face. Whatever. So as a result, I will not. <laughs> okay, thank you. It wasn't an invitation, but it sounded like one, didn't it? As a result, Sarah was raised and educated in an environment ripe with Freemasonic and Rosicrucian philosophy. Several of Sarah's uncles and cousins were Freemasons. But more, more importantly, at an early age, she was admitted to Yale's only female scholastic inst- institution, damn my mouth, known as the Young Ladies Collegiate Institute. Two of the school's most influential administrators and professors, Judson A. Root and his brother N.W. Taylor Root, were both Rose Craw, Croy? Rose Croy, yeah. Freemasons. In addition to the liberal arts, the Roots set forth a strict curriculum consisting of the sciences and mathematics. Sounds super fucking boring. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds really boring. You love math. <laughs> I see you I see you at home just doing math problems. Yeah, it's, it's just what I do in my spare time. Yeah. yeah. The other day I came over, he had that that board up with that algebra equation. Dude, there. trying to figure out what two plus two is has been a bitch. It's five. Everyone knows that. That's what I thought. <laughs> so furthermore, two of Sarah's schoolmates, Susan and Rebecca Bacon, were the daughters of New Haven's highly respected Reverend Dr. Leonard Woolsey Bacon, no relation to Francis Bacon, who was an English philosopher and statesman who served as Attorney General and as Lord Chancellor of England. Lord <laughs> Chancellor. Lord Chancellor. Just not here, but I'll do it. <laughs> Chancellor. Uh, his work are his works are credited with developing the scientific method and remained influential through the scientific revolution. Just in case you nerds out there were wondering who he was, that's who he was. So yeah, he invented bacon. He, he, inv- he invented <laughs> bacon. No. So while Sarah and the Bacon girls were attending the school, Doctor Bacon's sister Delia, also a New Haven resident, attracted considerable fame and attention for writing her famous treatise that Sir Francis Bacon, with the aid of a circle of the finest literary minds of the Elizabethan Jacobian age oh, yeah. was the actual author, editor, and publisher of the original works of Shakespeare. Yeah. Ha! That's crazy. That's fucking I'd nuts. I never heard of that until this, and then I kind of looked into it a little bit, and it's pretty wicked, dude. Right. So that, I think, I mean, so all those people out there, they were like, oh, Shakespeare was this. Also, there's no relation, but do you think that that's the only reason that she started on that thing was because she's like, well, his name's Bacon. My name's Bacon. Maybe. I'm going to have to figure out some stuff about bacon. Yeah. Bacon's good. There's a lot of bacon in the story. A lot of bacon. (laughs) Hopefully you guys like bacon. Well, uh, her work was sponsored by the author Nathaniel Hawthorne and was later supported by the likes of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Mark Twain. Good old Samuel Clemens. Dude, if you got those guys behind you, you're probably doing something right. That's pretty much the most intelligent literary geniuses of of, of all time, let alone their time. It's a couple. They're all right. (laughs) They're all right. They wrote a few things. Yeah, they're all right. Yeah. In addition to her writing, Delia Bacon gave numerous public lectures to uh, the citizens of New Haven. Thus, New Haven, Connecticut was the actual birthplace of the, quote, Bacon is Shakespeare doctrine. We're here to learn you folks. Shake and bake. That's right. (laughs) Shake and bake. (laughs) Yes, that's amazing. (laughs) So if you guys are kind of lost in that whole translation there, Moody, would you like to explain what, what that basically means? Basically, she had started doing a, um, <clears throat> she started doing research and wrote a paper um, that claims that uh, the writings of Shakespeare were actually written by Francis Bacon. There you go. So now you know. Word. Given her direct... Dear ex- mother. <laughs> we're to your mother. <laughs> What do you, motherfucker? We can write, too. Yeah, yeah, see that? (laughs) We're good. Given her direct exposure to the Baconian doctrine, along with her passion for the Shakespearean works, it was inevitable that Sarah was drawn like an irresistible force to a more than passing interest in the new theorem. Moreover, the Baconian Masonic preoccupation with secret encryption techniques using numbered cipher systems most certainly influenced young Sarah's worldview. This unique backdrop to Sarah's early development played a crucial role. Uh, role, which in essence defined what would become her life's work. So much smarts, so smart. She is incredibly brilliant. Like yes. fucking, like in this. Which is, is another thing I didn't know. Like she's in, ridiculously brilliant. You don't really hear about a lot of this stuff when people talk about it. Yeah. Maybe because it's kind of like on the nerdy end, it's more you know uh, academic. But right. uh, you don't really hear a lot about this kind of stuff. And I started looking into it. And I found this. I was like, you got to talk about it. this. Is crazy. She's, yeah. She's brilliant. So listen, you ladies li- listeners out there, you guys have been killing it for a long fucking time. We, Hell yeah. That's she's brilliant. She was fucking brilliant. She makes us yeah. look like way less brilliant. 
I was never really thought of as brilliant in the first place. I think you're brilliant. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> as we'll see, the Belle of New Haven became a staunch Baconian for the rest of her life. She just loved her bacon. BLT's Canadian bacon pancetta, she loved it all. Completely strict Absolutely. diet of fucking bacon, except turkey bacon, because fuck that shit. Ugh, so gross. It's like yeah. cardboard. Yeah, I don't like turkey Oof. bacon. No, but seriously, she also acquired a vast and uncanny knowledge of Masonic, Rosicrucian, ritual, and symbolism. Symbolism. It's symbolism. What's the uh, symbology here? <laughs> I believe the word you're looking for is symbolism. <laughs> Boondock Saints reference there for you folks. Additionally, she gravitated to theosophy. Theosophy is a religion established in the United States during the late 19th century. It was founded primarily by the Russian immigrant. Pretty ridiculous. Yeah, way. yeah I know. Uh, Helena B- B- Blavatsky. <clears throat> Madam Blavatsky. Her name is Blavatsky. You could do a show on her, too. She's yeah. crazy, dude. Yeah. I, I don't know much about her. Uh, you'd, you'd probably be into it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, she's crazy, man. And she draws um, and draws uh, its teachings predominantly from Bla- Bla- Blavatsky's writings. The name Blavatsky. I can't get it out. It's... I don't understand. <laughs> Yuri, you don't, do you know Blavatsky? I admit, I, I believe I date in, in a college. Okay. I date her in college. You yeah. know, small thing. She was, I heard she was kind of crazy. It's very small. Yeah. Yes. She, no, she's crazy in the she's, sack. Is she small? Small in stature. Yes. Very. Oh, okay. Yes. But in the sack, she was, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Crazy girl. You know the scale they say? they say. The Russians are, you know. That's what they, you don't know, buddy. <laughs> Author and historian Ralph Rambo, who actually knew Sarah and is a direct descendant of American badass and war hero John J. Rambo, <laughs> wrote, quote, it is believed that Mrs. Winchester was a theosophist. End quote. That's, that's <laughs> one hell of a quote. Yeah. Rambo didn't elabor- elaborate on the matter, making him and his statement one of the more boring we've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> but since he was close to Sarah, he was certainly in a position to know some things about her. It should be noted that most Rosicrucianists are theosophists. There you go. Bet you guys didn't know that, did you? I did, only because I read it before you. Okay. So, <laughs> so Sarah adhered both to Bacon's Kabbal- Kabbalistic theosophy. God, these words today. Was that, was that your band? That was your band, wasn't it? It's actually a, the eternal belief in the Mortal Kombat franchise. Yeah. No, it's not. But I did have a band called Cabal. Yeah. Yes. But it was with a C. Oh, well, you're lame then. And it was actually um, based off of, it wasn't like based off the Kabbalah or Kabbalism or anything like that. It was actually based off of the movie, um, oh, shit. Um, uh, I believe it was a Wes Craven, was it a Wes Craven movie? Mm-hmm. With the monsters of Midian, they lived. It was your band. What are you asking me for? No, you, the movie. Jackass, um, the where they the monsters of Midian they lived underground. When you died, you became a monster, and that was oh, your, uh, Nightbreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah Nightbreed. Yeah. Yep. Because the guy's name he's like you are Cabal. Yeah. I was like, <gasps> that's amazing, and I named my band that, and it was really bad. It's, it's probably the <laughs> worst band I've ever been involved, and in. I've been in some shit. Just saying. Anyway, <laughs> so um, <laughs> she was also super into the Theosophical perspective held by Rudolf Steiner. Steiner viewed the universe as a vast living organism in which all things are likened to individually evolving units or cells that comprise a greater universal synergistic body that is, quote, ever building. As we shall further see, the ever building theme was the core of Sarah's methodology. Was it? Yeah, that's what I hear. We'll guess, find out. Guess we'll find out. William Wirt Winchester was born in Baltimore, Maryland on July 22nd, Winchester. 1837. That's right. The Winchester. He was the only son of Oliver Fisher Winchester and Jane Ellen Hope. In keeping with a popular trend of the day, he was named after William Wirt, the highly popular and longest serving attorney general of the United States. They, they all really like the attorney general for some reason. I, like, I don't know why you like, I, I don't get naming your kids after like famous people. I think back then were, na- I don't know, maybe names just weren't that That vast. reminds me. Actually, that reminds me of two things. Oh, shit. I don't know why it reminded me of the one thing, but I forgot to mention it earlier. Okay. Uh, being that we're talking about haunted houses, I have a story after everything about my house. My wife is not going to want to hear this, but yes. I, have, I have another story. All right, good. And two, speaking of naming after famous people, my daughter's hockey game yesterday, mm-hmm. there was this kid skating around. His last name was Young, right? Mm-hmm. No shit. The kid's name is Angus Young. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Because they were all yelling like, oh, Angus, Angus, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I looked at the kid and it said young on the back. I'm like, that can't be real. <laughs> that can't. And then like he turned it and it said it on his helmet, Angus. Like his fucking name is Angus Young. I don't, 
Am I mad at that or no? I don't know if I am. I don't know, man. It's just weird. Because there's Angus Young. I like the name Angus, actually. Yeah. I just don't know if I would do that if my kid's name was Young. Yeah, I don't know. That kid's going to get fucked with. Either that or he's going to be the coolest kid well, in school. He's got a lot of he's got a lot to live up to. With yeah, that for sure. As long as he wears that outfit, he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Soon after William's arrival, the Winchesters moved to New Haven, where the enterprising Oliver, along with his partner, John Davies, founded a successful clothing manufacturing company. Gradually, mm. the Winchester patriarch amassed a considerable fortune. Later, Oliver channeled his efforts into a firearms manufacturing venture that eventually to firearms. Yep, eventually evolved into the famous Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Fucking Winchester. Woo. Woo Woo! According to historical documents, the Winchesters and the parties were very well acquainted, particularly through the auspices of New Haven's First Baptist Church. <laughs> Church. Baptist Church. Oh boy. Fire and brimstone. Oh boy. Additionally, Sarah Party and William's sister Annie were classmates at the Young Ladies Collegiate Institute. Yes, for the young ladies. Just, just them, Moody. Not far away, William attended New Haven's Collegiate and Commercial Institute, another arm of Yale College. Here, William's teacher included N.W. Taylor Root, one of Sarah's instructors that we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and Henry E. Party, who was another of Sarah's cousins. There's all kinds of cousins and shit going on. Thus, young Sarah... But unlike the Hatfields and McCoys... <laughs> it wasn't cousin not fucking. marrying and fucking. That's right. A little, di little different society here, yeah. A little bit. Thus, young Sarah and William found themselves studying virtually the same curriculum under very similar circumstances. Moreover, like the parties, the Winchester family was not lacking in members who were Freemasons. So they kind of... They're kind of both cut from the same cloth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, their families seem to parallel each other right. in a lot of ways. Sarah and William were married on September 30th, 1862. Their only child, Annie Party Winchester, came into the world on July 12th, 1866. Unfortunately, due to an infantile disease known as marismus, which I'd never heard of before, a severe form of malnutrition due to the body's inability to metabolize proteins, little Annie died 40 days later. Sucks. Ugh. Yeah. In 1880, old Oliver Fisher Winchester died, leaving the succession of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company to his only son. One year later, William died of fucking tuberculosis at the age of 43. Motherfucking TB. Consumption, man. Jesus. Also, the uh, if you if you really look into the story of the uh, Winchester fortune, like the how Winchester came to be, and how the rifles actually were made, and like all this stuff, like it evolved from <clears throat> basically a gun that sucked really bad into what it is now and it's it's a pretty cool story like how it how it evolved to where it came that's awesome like where it ended up i like i like me a good old winchester these things are expensive as shit by the way if you like, get an old one like old school ones i actually went to the uh the gun show yesterday yeah, yeah and they had some there that were ridiculously expensive i mean it was just me posing in a tank top yeah oh <laughs> 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 I don't think that's the one you were going for. It wasn't, but it works. Whatever. <laughs> so the double loss of Annie and William was a staggering blow to Sarah. However, the loss did leave the widow Winchester with, this is awesome, an inheritance incredible. of $20 million. That's, that's an 1880 money. Right. That's $510 million today. Okay. Plus nearly 50% of the Winchester arm stock, which in turn, get this, folks. <laughs> this is fucking ridiculous. Earned her approximately $1,000 per day. Mm. 1880 money. That's $25,000 a day in today's money. Yeah. It's actually a little bit over that. It's closer to 30. And that's in royalties for the rest of her life. So the Did result of which... you imagine making $30,000 a fucking day? Nope. <laughs> nope. Could not even imagine it. You're just sitting there and you just made $30,000 mm -hmm. doing nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> so this honestly made her one of the uh, wealthiest women in the world. You get it, girl? Dude, she would still be today. That would make her one of the richest people in the world, probably. Yeah, so back then, dude. like 500 mil, that's a half a billion dollars off the rip, and then $30,000 a day almost. It's insane. <laughs> now, now, what's crazy, too, is that it, so not only is she the richest woman in the world, but she's one of the smartest. Yeah. 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 Like, fuck. Absolutely. Like, she's just a package. That's, I, yeah, I mean... Was she a looker? Uh, it's, well, they said she so, was beautiful. But see, I saw a couple of pictures. The only pictures I really saw of her was when she was like older. So I was like, mm, you'd I still do about, it. I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I just choked on ice. <laughs> so according to Ralph Rambo, John J. Rambo's great uncle, Sarah went on a three-year world tour with her new band, Rifles and Posies, who sold three million records worldwide and had a huge hit with their single, Fuck Tuberculosis, before settling in California in 1884. I heard they were good. They were pretty good. That's what they I heard. One hell of a washtub player. Yeah, they did. In banjos. Yeah. Right. Obviously, that's bullshit. But anyway, the New Haven's Register, dated 1886, lists Sarah as having been removed to Europe. No other information has survived to tell us exactly where Mrs. Winchester went during those years or what her activities consisted of. But we can project some well-educated theories. Although Freemasonry has traditionally barred women from its uh, membership, there are numerous documented cases in which some headstrong women have gained admittance into liberal Masonic lodges as far back as the 18th century. Headstrong, a.k.a. loaded. Right. (laughs) Oh, she's so headstrong. You mean rich. Oh, yes. She is also very rich. You know, they're, you know they're all trying to get a piece of that, For too. sure. A movement in uh, France called Co-Mason, uh, Freemasonry, uh, Co-Freemasonry, sorry, I fucked that up, which allows for male and female membership was already underway when Sarah arrived in that country. Given her social status, a predilection towards Freemasonic tenets, and a mastery of the European, European languages, which I can't even do the English language. <laughs> Good on you, Sarah. Sarah could easily have been admitted into any of the permissive French Masonic lodges. So she bounced over to France, was like, step back, bitches. We oui, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Palais-vous, fuck you. She know, uh, she know Jacques? I do not know her. No? No, I'm sorry. I have not met this Sarah. I was not allowed in the Freemasons either. Sarah Winchester, right? Was the last name? I believe so, yes. Okay. I do not like guns. You don't, you don't, oh, no? No. no? I do not like guns. No. How come? Because <laughs> they hurt people. Oh, you never hurt anybody? No, not with guns. <laughs> what do you hurt people with? I use my fucking fist because I am French. <laughs> Another possible scenario involving Mrs. Winchester's activities while abroad could have well included visits to esoteric architectural landmarks such as the French Cathedral of Chartres. Sarah's Masonic Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian interest in labyrinths would have drawn her to uh, Chartres. Chartres or Chartres? Chartres? I don't fucking know I'm not French. You know, it, it, is, it is Chartres. Oh, hey. Hey. Okay. Okay. With its 11 circuit labyrinth, a puzzle like feature that stresses the discipline of the initiatic tradition of the ancient mystery schools. Ugh, you guys got all that? You should go check that place out. Yeah, it sounds pretty fucking awesome, actually. <laughs> Likewise, she would also have found inspiration in the Freemasonic symbology and the mysterious structure, including a staircase that leads nowhere, and we will definitely be talking about that, of Rosslyn Chapel familiar. in Scotland. So she was into this architecture because it was done in kind of a, a you know, like puzzle-like, and so she wanted to kind of like see it and figure it out and whatever. So, I mean, again, we're talking about an extremely brilliant person. Yeah, she was, yeah, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, she's just amazing. So in 1884, Sarah took up residence in the San Francisco Bay Area, eventually moving inland to the Santa Clara Valley, now known as San Jose to buy an eight-room f- France to San Jose. That's right. That's such a... Woo. Yeah, that, you couldn't go any further from anywhere. Than, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> well, she bought an eight-room farmhouse from one Dr. Or, uh, Robert Caldwell. Dr. Robert Caldwell. Her apparent motive for the move was to live in close proximity to her numerous party relatives, most of whom had come to California during the 1849 gold rush and were scattered from Sacramento to the Bay Area. One of these party relatives... Is it Enoch? Yeah, yeah, Enoch. Yeah. Enoch, okay. Yeah. Enoch H. Party had become a highly respected physician and politician while living in Oakland. Later, his son, George C. Party, followed in his foot's, uh, father's footsteps, rising to the office of governor of California. He was the governor of California. <laughs> oh, my God. We have so much in common. Did he ever fight a predator, though? I don't know. It's possible. We both like guns. It's crazy. Oh my god! <laughs> that is the worst. <laughs> it's not. It's not good. Uh, Arnold, get the fuck out of here! I saw you leaving. It is interesting that Wikipedia makes particular uh, note of Enoch Party having been a pr- prominent occultist. Most likely, the occult reference has to do with the fact that both Enoch, Enoch, and his son George were members of the highly secretive and mysterious California-based Bohemian Club, which Ooh. was an offshoot of Yale's Skull and Bone Society. Ooh. Yeah. Moreover, Enoch and George were Knights Templar Freemasons. So they were in all kinds of shit. Yeah, dude, there were some those are some uh those are some people you don't you don't really want to fuck with people like that. There's mm-hmm. a lot of connections in there and there's 
Mm -mm. All that weird shit going on, man. Yeah, I don't, I don't mess around. Part of all that stuff. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That's how you wind up dead. Or president. <laughs> you gotta have. Well, then again, though, those people that are involved in that stuff usually come from that that the, higher, the wealth and the, the upper, upper crust. crust. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Hey. We're us. We're just crumbs <laughs> on the table. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Also interesting is the fact that President Theodore Roosevelt, another member of the Bohemia Club, came to California in 1903 to ask Governor Party to run as his vice presidential candidate in the 1904 Ooh. national election. Ooh. The offer was turned down. Oh. During the same trip, Roosevelt attempted to visit Sarah Party Winchester. Again, Roosevelt's offer was turned down. So wait or a minute. Or was it? So question. Yeah. I might have an answer for you. So, <clears throat> did he go to talk to her? Not about becoming a vice president. Okay, no, that's no, no, no. what I was. That's he yeah, went yeah. to talk to the guy about being his vice president, and then the the uh, the story goes is that he wanted to see the house, so he went to try to find her to talk to her and see the house. Because this was after she had already started. Building it just the says house again, stuff. Roosevelt's offer was turned down. So if he offered, well, she, the offer to go see the house and talk to her just to see everything was turned down. Oh, yeah. We'll, was, we'll get a little bit more into it. It was later. very confusing there. But that's pretty cool that Teddy Roosevelt was all up in that shit. Fucking Teddy, man. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So let's talk a little bit about the house. This is what yeah. you guys wanted to hear. We got past the nerd shit. Right? The house? The what house? house? The, the Winchester house? house. There's a house involved. The Winchester house. I thought it was a gun. <laughs> it, it was a gun. It is a gun. Why did Arnold come back? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> the story goes that after the death of her child and her husband, she moved to California, like we talked about, and bought the eight-room farmhouse and began building. It is said once construction started, it was a continuous process. Workers in the area would work in shifts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're going to explore the stories about her mental state, the construction of the house, and the reports of ghosts and spooky stuff. Of course, that's what we're here for. How, what? how would you sleep? Like this? <clears throat> But if there's construction going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> I don't know, man. How do you sleep through that? You, I, I would assume you get used to it after a while, right? <laughs> People banging around and it's not like they had power tools. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, they just got hammers and like those big long freaking saws that go <laughs> one dude on each end. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Billy, exactly. you're not pulling when you're supposed to pull. <laughs> People losing limbs left and right. So the story supposedly starts like this. There was no plan. No official blueprints were drawn up. No architectural vision was created. And yet a once unfinished house took shape on a sprawling lot in the heart of San Jose, California. Inside, staircases ascended through several levels, levels before ending abruptly. Doorways opened to blank walls and corners rounded to dead ends. The house was the brainchild of our Sarah Winchester, heir by marriage, of course, to the Winchester Firearms Fortune, one of the richest chicks ever in the entire world. And smart as a whip. As smart as a coo whip. <laughs> the project began in 1884, and uh, rumors have swirled about the construction, the inhabitants, and the seemingly endless maze that sits at 525 South Winchester Boulevard. So go toilet paper it. No, don't do that. No? No. Well, if you do, tell them some other podcast sent you. <laughs> You no, know? yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Today, the house is known as the Winchester Mystery House, but at the time of its construction, it was simply Sarah Winchester's house. Newly <laughs> makes sense. I mean, yeah, it's her fucking house. This is John Sayers. House. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Newly in possession of a massive fortune and struggling with the loss of her husband and daughter, she sought the advice of a medium, which always works out well. Oh, of course. She hoped, perhaps, to get advice from the beyond as to how to spend her fortune or what to do with her life. Though the exact specifics remain between Sarah Winchester and her medium, the story goes that the medium was able to channel dearly departed William. Of course he was. Yes, of course. He, yeah, that's exactly how that works. Who advised Sarah to leave her home in New Haven, Connecticut and head west to California. Wow. He was like, Sarah, you must leave. <laughs> Go to California. I feel like San Jose would be wonderful. They're going to have an amazing <laughs> hockey team one day. <laughs> Or not so amazing, whichever way you look at it. As far as what to do with her money, William answered that too. Wow. Oh. Did he? Did he now? 
William said she was to use the fortune to build a home for the spirits of those who had fallen victim to Winchester rifles. Good story, though. Lest she be haunted by them for the rest of her life. It's a pretty cool story right there. I mean, you know, so the spirits told her that... Look, that shit we made killed a lot of people. You're probably going to want to take <laughs> care of that. <laughs> Just build it for them. It'll be fine. I've if you talk- build it, I've they been, will come. I've been talking to some of these guys. <laughs> They're not happy. Yeah, there's a whole group of dudes that are just ready to. <laughs> they are not happy. So do me a favor, build this fucked up house, and let them let them chill there. You know, it'll be fine. So after this, when she ended up in San Jose and purchased the farmhouse, this is when she did this. Winchester hired carpenters to work around the clock, expanding the small house into a seven story mansion. Seven story. That's big as shit. The construction of the house was an ever-building enterprise. Again, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The house gradually mushroomed outward and upward. By the turn of the century, Sarah Winchester had her ghost house, an oddly laid out mansion with, you guys ready for this? Seven stories, 161 rooms, 47 fireplaces, 10,000 panes of glass. That's a lot of glass. Two basements, three elevators. Interesting. And a mysterious fun house like interior. I like it. Yeah, it sounds, like it. actually sounds pretty if fun. If I cool. could build a house, it'd probably be something like that. It actually sounds pretty fun. I did read something else that... Uh, <laughs> so, the first thing I read about the house said that at one point it had 500 rooms. Jesus and I was Christ, like, <laughs> that's a bit excessive. I was like, I don't... I can't be right. Like, is that... There's no way. And then I read, a, like, it was the only thing that I found that said that it ever had that many rooms. The general consensus is, like, this 160-ish rooms. I don't know where they got 500 rooms from. I don't know where you would put 500 rooms, but that's a lot of fucking rooms. Somebody making up shit, you yeah. bastards. Yeah, see what I have to go through I to know, find I the know. truth, and the we, goddamn truth? We appreciate it. We're su- truth seekers, we are. It's a good show, by the way. Yeah, I know. I don't know if I've ever seen it. Oh, you keep talking about yeah, that. It's yeah, it's good. I need Simon to watch Peg. That. Yeah, yeah, I need to watch that. Nick Frost, it's good stuff. So uh, the house was actually built at a price tag of five million dollars. Okay, in 1923 money. Yeah, which is around 71 million dollars today. <laughs> That's fucking insane. That's a shitload of fucking money. Just think about think about all them big ass mansions you see, like like sports stars and all that. Like they're in like the 15 to 20 million. Right, right, right. 71. You know what kind of fucking spread you could have for 71 million dollars? A big one. Yeah. Like you could buy a fucking island for that. You could probably buy several islands. Let's do that. You could probably buy a small country, to be honest with you. So what country? Whatever. Let's. What's small? Liechtenstein. Let's buy That's a small country. Let's buy. What's a good country to buy? Yeah, but it's got to be small. Probably impoverished. Where's what about? Where's Transylvania? That's in Poland. Transylvania's in Poland. Yes. Are you sure? Pretty sure. Let's buy Poland. Be, is it Poland or Bulgaria? Maybe it's it's Bulgaria, isn't it? I don't know. It's one of those. <laughs> We're stupid folks. <laughs> we don't know geography. Anyway, let's just buy Transylvania. I, I think that'd be fun. Whatever. Anyway. That'd be a city. We could buy a city. Let's buy the city or then. Territory or something. Yeah. Due to the lack of plan and the presence of an architect, the house was constructed haphazardly. Rooms were added onto exterior walls, resulting in windows overlooking other rooms. Multiple staircases would be added, all with different sized risers, giving each staircase a distorted look. It's in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Let's just buy Romania. There is a uh, there is a forest that I want to talk about in an episode, though. Okay, there. in Romania. Yep. We, we should do haunted forests. Dude, right. there's a there's a killer one out there that I want to talk about. Is it? It's like one of the most haunted. Literally killer. Like, kind of, yeah. Oh God. Sounds fun. Yeah, it's great. So gold and silver chandeliers hung from the ceilings above hand inlaid parquet flooring. Dozens of artful stained glass windows created by Tiffany and company, which right there is going to cost you a fucking arm and a leg. Yeah, yeah. Dotted the walls, including some design by Louis Comfort, Tiffany himself, like the main dude. One window in particular was intended to create a prismatic rainbow effect on the floor when light flowed through it. Of course, the window ended up on an exterior or interior wall, (laughs) and thus the effect was never achieved. Even more luxurious than the fixtures was the plumbing and electrical work. Rare for the time, the Winchester Mystery House boasted indoor plumbing, including coveted hot running water and push-button gas lighting available throughout the home. Additionally, forced air heating flowed through the house. Holy shit. What the fuck do you need heating for in California? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the fact that she has it is pretty fucking cool. I'm not going to yeah, lie. Yeah, she's just being, she was just flaunting it then. She was like... 
I want heating in my house. <laughs> He's like, what is it in your house? 58? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> it needs to be a blistery 95 degrees in this house at all times. <laughs> okay, that's how I keep the ghosts away, it's motherfucker. Like, <laughs> all right. The ghosts hate Yeah, the they don't like the heat. They Haven't work you ever off noticed of... how it gets cold when ghosts Correct. are around? Exactly. They don't like it, so fuck it. I want it 95 or hotter. <laughs> Adding further to the mysterious features, the prime numbers 7, 11, and 13 are repeatedly displayed in various ways throughout the house. The number 13 being most prominent. These numbers consistently show up in the numbers of windows in many of the rooms, or the numbers of stairs in the staircases, or the numbers of rails in the railings, or the number of panels in the floors and walls, or the number of lights and chandeliers, etc. <laughs> Unquestionably, these three prime numbers were extremely important to Sarah. In 1906, something happened that would change the landscape of California and the Winchester House. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake struck the coast of Northern California at 5.12 a.m. on Wednesday, April 18th, with an estimated moment um, magnitude of 7.9. Boosh. And a maximum Mercalli intensity. I've never heard of that scale. I've never heard of that either. I think that was what they used before the... uh... The Richter scale. Okay. Because they didn't have, the, everything I was reading, it was they don't have an accurate, uh, like, Richter scale reading because I wasn't around. That 7.9 is, like, what they assumed from from the damage and the way everything went and, like, the uh, like where they felt the aftershocks and the tremors. The 7.9 is their best guess of what it would be on the Richter scale. Okay. Well, this Mercalli intensity of XI, which 11. would be extreme. 11? Yes. Well, it's still XI. I'm not wrong. It threw me off, too. I'm like, why did they go XI? And then I saw there was a little chart that had the scales like oh. XI, X. I'm like, oh, it's numbered. Okay. So it's 11. Yeah. So which is extreme. High intensity shaking was felt from Eureka on this the North one, Coast. This one went to 11. It did go to 11. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just make that one louder? <laughs> so it went uh, from Eureka on the North Coast to the Salinas Valley, an agricultural region to the south of the San Francisco Bay Area. Devastating fires soon broke out in the city and lasted for several days. More than 3,000 people died. Yikes. Over 80% of the city of San Francisco was destroyed. <laughs> The events are remembered as one of the worst and deadliest earthquakes in the history of the United States. The death toll remains the greatest loss of life from a natural disaster in California's history and high on the list of American disasters. Although the impact of the earthquake on San Francisco was the most famous, the earthquake also inflicted considerable damage on several other cities. These include San Jose and Santa Rosa, the entire downtown of which was essentially destroyed. Since if the damage in San Jose was located at... Uh, you guessed it, the Winchester house. There's supposed to be some. Yeah, well. <laughs> so some, some, of, so some, some of the house got fucked up, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Standing seven stories at the time, the house was damaged badly, and the top three floors were essentially reduced, and the house set, uh, set at, uh, let's see, set at four stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Moody. Look, man. I missed that one. I got a, hey, I got a computer coming. Okay. Good. So Yay! just to do so for just for research, so I don't have to do this all on my goddamn phone anymore. Love it. That's awesome. So yeah, the house was only at store uh, four stories from that point on, right? So because yeah. they knocked down the top three stories. After, so. Yeah, basically they were so damaged that they just knocked them down, and uh, the sto- the house has been four stories ever since. Okay. So aside from its immense size and Victorian style architecture, the house has a number of unique characteristics. To begin, it is undeniably a labyrinth. There are literally miles of maze-like corridors and twisting hallways, some of which, like we said, have dead ends, forcing the traveler to turn around and back up. I'd be so pissed off. <laughs> if I'm like, where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> ah, damn it! <laughs> it's a fucking wall! I'm peeing right here. I don't care. <laughs> fuck it. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to fuck up here right here. It's like a cat back into the corner. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Someone else can find it. There are also some centrally located... Or not. Lo- or not. <laughs> <laughs> Probably going to be a while. <laughs> If you can even get back out, you're just sitting there with your own piss in the corner like, fuck. There are also some centrally located passages and stairways that serve as shortcuts, allowing a virtual leap from one side of the house to the other. Traversing the labyrinth is truly dizzying and disorienting to one's sensibilities. The house abounds in oddities and anomalous features. There are rooms within (laughs) rooms within rooms. There is a staircase that leads nowhere, abruptly halting at the ceiling. Seems fun. In another place, there is a door which opens into a solid wall. Some of the house's 47 chimneys have an overhead ceiling, while in some places, there are skylights covered by a roof. (laughs) And some skylights are covered by another skylight. And in one place, there is a skylight built into the floor. (laughs) What the fuck is going on? Oh my god, it's like my five-year-old granddaughter just built this place. Yeah. Yeah. 
There are tiny doors leading into large spaces and large doors that lead into very small spaces. In another part of the house, a second story door opens outward to a sheer drop to the ground below. <laughs> hey, whoa! whoa! Yeah. It's like a fucking cartoon. Ma'am, I'd like to sell you these. Oh, you need to walk through that door. My, yeah, that's where we talk. Uh, <laughs> Let me show you out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moreover, upside down pillars can be found all about the house. Many visitors to the Winchester Mansion have justifiably compared it, um, been compared its strange design to the work of the late Dutch artist M.C. Escher, which I was actually going to say that that sounds He's very... like my favorite rapper. Yeah, M.C. Escher? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to you right now. Nothing. <laughs> Practically a small town unto itself, the Winchester estate was virtually self-sufficient with its own carpenter and plumber's workshops, along with an on-premise water and electrical supply and sewage drain system. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Like she has her own everything there. She doesn't there. have to fucking go anywhere. Yeah, basically her own freaking little town right there. That's awesome. On September 5th, 1922, Sarah died in her sleep of heart failure. <sighs> Sucks. A service was held in Palo Alto, California, and her remains lay at Alta Mesa Cemetery until they were transferred. Almost 100 years since. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're creeping up. Yeah. Next year. Yeah. Along with those of her sister, um, um, oh, they were transferred along with those of her sister to New Haven, Connecticut. She was buried next to her husband and their infant child in Evergreen Cemetery, New Haven, Connecticut. She left a will, a will written in 13 sections, which she signed 13 times. Remember those numbers again, right? Yeah. 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 Wow. Now, did she sign each section once? So that was, th- or did she just sign her name 13 times? Just at the yeah. very end, there's just 13 like, signatures. Sarah Winchester, Sarah Winchester, <laughs> Sarah Winchester, Sarah Winchester. I would assume it's each time, but who knows? Right now, I mean, listen, she was very eccentric. In accordance with her will, Sarah had her entire estate divided up in generous proportions to be distributed among a number of charities and those people who had faithfully spent years in her service. Her favorite niece and secretary, Marion Marriott. F- wow, great name. Marion Marriott. <laughs> Marion Marriott, yeah. I wonder, I wonder if she has anything to do with the hotels. I pop, I don't the, know. Hotel, the Marriott Hotel fortune? Possibly. She's a Wouldn't host. be surprised given the... Uh... Family backgrounds and yeah, things. Very possible. Yeah. Well, she saw the uh, the oversaw the removal and sale of all of Sarah's furnish, uh, furnishings and personal property. Roy Leib, uh, Mrs. Winchester's attorney of many years, had been named in her will as executor to her estate. He sold the house to the people who, in 1933, preserved it as a living museum. And today, it is known as the Winchester Mystery House, also known as California Historical Landmark Number Eight Six Eight. So interesting thing about that is I saw that when I originally started looking that it was a landmark and everything. I thought that the house was owned. I thought it was like basically a publicly owned thing, like the, the state owned it or the city. But it's still a privately owned house, but it's still considered a landmark and everything like that. So well, there's a lot historical, of historical, right? Yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, that believe like I did that the house is like a publicly owned, like by the city or the state or whatever. But it's not. It's still privately owned. That's pretty awesome. So, Oh, excuse me. Um, although no mention, <laughs> thank you. Now, although no mention has ever surfaced as to any spe- uh, specific guidelines or special instructions by which Mister Live would select a buyer for the property, one gets the distinct impression that Sarah wanted the house to stand intact and perpetually preserved, and so it does. So there's a little story about the guy who bought it later. Okay, and there's just like one little line in there. It's not funny, but just because just because it's in there and the way the story goes, it's hilarious to me. Oh, boy. You'll see it. It's funny. So some of this stuff we've touched on already, but here's a rundown of the folklore behind the house. Despite the fact that Sarah Winchester was extremely secretive about herself, nearly all of what uh, the public thinks it knows about her reads like a mishmash of gossip, you know, out of the National Enquirer. Some refer to this body of misinformation as the folklore. Indeed, on a re- uh, research visits to the Winchester Mystery House, a senior tour guide informed one writer that, quote, in the old days, the tour guides were encouraged to make up stuff just to give some spice to the story. Oh, <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, I mean, just keep reading. All right. You know, you All right. Know. The folklore about Sarah says that after William's death in 1881, the highly distraught Mrs. Winchester sought the advice of then famous Boston medium Adam Coons. During a seance with Coons, Sarah was told that because of the many people who had been slain by the Winchester rifle, she was cursed by the Winchester fortune. Coons further instructed Sarah that the angry spirits demanded that she move to California and build them a house. Upon her arrival in California, Sarah began holding her own seances every midnight so that she could receive the next day's building instructions from the spirits. (laughs) Her seances allegedly involved the use of a Ouija board and a planchette. In 13, there's a number again... 
various colored robes she would ritualistically wear each night for the edu edu edification of the spirits within the confines of her seance room. That's actually super cool. It's crazy. But, sure, sure. <laughs> but it's cool. Right. To further appease the angry spirits, <laughs> Mrs. Winchester made sure the construction of the house went on nonstop again, 24-7, 365 days a year, for fear that she would be building, um, that the, if the building were to ever stop, she would die. So she literally thought that if the if they didn't continue building, that she would literally die yeah. from this. Yeah. Wow. For son, for son, for some, for some <laughs> reason, there's this story. Fuck you. <laughs> for some inexplicable reason, however, Mrs. Winchester took precautions in the building design um, so as to incorporate all of the strange features of the house to, quote, confuse the evil spirits. Moreover, she would ring her alarm bell every night at midnight to signal the spirits that it was seance time, and then again at 2 a.m., signaling the spirits that it was time to depart, which begs the question, who is in charge of whom, and why would spirits have an inability or need to keep track of time? I mean, I guess it'd be like if you don't have to work for a long time, you just kind of lose track of what day it is. I just see her sitting around, reading a book. She's like, <laughs> looks at her watch, like, it's that time. <laughs> Come on, ghost, get in the room. Get in the room. <laughs> right, someone touched my ass. Stop that. <laughs> Whenever people make mention of Sarah Winchester, the typical response you get from people is, quote, oh, yeah, wasn't she the crazy lady who built the weird house because she was afraid the spirits would kill her? Many of these people have never been to the Winchester house. Their source is usually the television. Quote, America's most haunted places. I don't know why I said quote, but America's most haunted places tops the list of TV shows that grossly reinforces the folklore of the house. I, I'm not a big fan of all those haunted shows and shit. No, really I mean, they're... When they're, I was a kid, they were They're fun. cool, but they're also... You have to take everything with a grain of salt because they're there. The show wouldn't be interesting if they were like, right. it might be haunted. It's kind of a creepy house. <laughs> eh. And then there's us. <laughs> yeah. We're like, it's haunted. No, it's not. <laughs> no, that's, that's you. It's, that is it's me. not me. That is 100% me. I'm like, it is? Let's go check it out. But the story behind it and her is fascinating to me. Yeah. Like, she is yeah, yeah. a fascinating woman. So yeah. I'm absolutely enamored by her. For now. Yeah. Oh, boy. The misinformation yeah. is further compounded by the haunted house tour business thriving in San Jose as the commercial enterprise known as the Winchester Mystery House, which profits um, by perpetuating the folklore myth. Of course, that's how they keep money coming in. In fairness to the management of the Winchester uh, Mansion uh, House, or Mystery House, they try to present Mrs. Winchester in a positive light. However, their Halloween flashlight tours, along with booklets, postcards, coffee mugs, and other sundry items being sold in the WMH souvenir shop, displaying the title of the mansion designed by spirits, only enhances the folklore version of Sarah Winchester's life. You've got to hand it to them. They've, you know, created a highly effective marketing strategy for a very lucrative commercial enterprise. These are good people who mean well, but this is hardly the legacy Sarah wanted to leave to posterity. Posterity. That's what I said. Posterity. Posterity. Right. You're prosperous, right? No. <laughs> Even in more recent times, the house gives uh, keeps giving up secrets. In 2016, a secret attic was discovered. Inside the attic were a pump organ, a Victorian-era couch, a dress form, a sewing machine, and various paintings. There was rumor that Sarah had a secrecy room full of undisplayed treasures and large amounts of cash. It was thought this attic may have been that room, but there was no concrete proof of this. That's pretty cool. Yeah, they just found a room. In 2016. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. So just five years ago, they're just like looking around and like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone ever been up there? I, don't, I, I, I haven't. Have you? Is that a door? Be Bill, have you ever, you ever been up there? No. Hold on, get everybody in here real quick. <laughs> we got we yeah. to figure this yeah, out. Yeah, let's figure this out. Guys, uh... Or they just, like, walked into a door and just like, <laughs> wait, what the... <laughs> Close the door again, look around, like, eh, is this... Have we... This always been... Well, then again, I guess you... Unless you marked everything, you're probably getting confused everywhere yeah. you go anyway. And if it was in, like, one of those random hallways... And, and it just, just looked like a door that, like, yeah. A, yeah, I don't know, that's kind of... Or it might have been, like, a hidden door, like, just in the wall that you had to kind of... Or a door behind a door behind a door... Under a skylight. <laughs> <laughs> Under a skylight. So these are the stories about Sarah Winchester and her house. Now comes the sad news. Uh, most of what you think you know and most of what you've just heard are myths. <laughs> <laughs> stories that have grown over the years about the woman and the house. Early on, we talked about President Roosevelt trying to visit Sarah and the house. If you forgot, the story goes that Theodore Roosevelt attempted to visit Sarah at home in 1903, 1903 but was turned away. 
This is used as an example of her alleged weirdness. It is said the rumors likely started about Sarah because in life, she was extremely private, refused to address gossip, and did not engage much in the community. She, God, I love this woman. This yeah. infamous presidential visit never occurred. Eyewitness accounts state that the president's carriage never stopped at the Winchester place. Furthermore, Winchester had rented a house near San Francisco that year to prepare for the wedding of her niece. So she wasn't even at home. She wasn't even there. She wasn't even there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry. All that shit you thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> now you know, no, now you know. <laughs> there is another myth that Sarah would spy on her employees. It is said that some employees believe Sarah could walk through walls and close doors. The claims are that Sarah had elaborate spying features built into the house. There is no evidence she spied on her on her workers. Would a suspicious employer retain the same workers for decades? Would she name them all in her will? Would she buy them homes? Would they name children after her? All these things happened, like actually happened. In yeah. short, there is yep. no evidence that she ever spied on her employees. Yeah, if you were that worried about people and you were spying on them all the time, like, right? why would you treat them so goddamn well? Right, exactly. You know, and why would you be, of them. and you would be revered by them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If they all thought you were spying on them, they wouldn't be all, yeah, I'm going to name my kid after you. <laughs> Remember that bitch that used to spy on me? I like her name. <laughs> Let's see who's I'll that. show her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll show her who's boss. Name, name that kid her. <laughs> Then there is the fascination with the number of 13 and several other numbers. Since websites detail the occurrences of 13 in the house, 13 robe hooks in the seance room, 13 panes of glass in several windows, a stairway with 13 steps, just to name a few different things. These facts are used um, to evident, uh, as evidence to prove the woman was ruled by superstition. References to the number 13 were added after Sarah's death, according to workers at the time. The 13 hooks were added just not too long ago. Yeah, that was something... Um... The article I read about that was, this is an older article talking about that. So the 13 hooks were headed. I mean, it was a little while ago, but as of compared to like today, but basically that the 13 robe hooks and that whole thing were added fairly recently, but that's another story that gets perpetuated. So yeah, yeah. poor lady. Yeah. Then we have some of the crazy architecture here. The story goes that the uh, and she built crazy things like hallways to nowhere, stairs to nowhere, doors that lead to walls, and doors that lead to several story drops to confuse spirits. Some websites make much of the architectural oddities of the house, such as doors and flights of stairs leading into walls and how they were supposedly built to confuse vengeful ghosts. Some say there is a more natural explanation. You know, the 1906 earthquake. Correct. Research uncovered the fact that there was a massive da there was masses da map. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes my 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 mouth goes faster than my brain. I feel you, buddy. Right, I feel you. It happens so often. It does. Better than the opposite, I guess. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, well, sometimes the brain gets ahead, and then you're stuck back here, and then you can't catch up. Yeah, I get you, buddy. Catch up, mustard. All right. Anyway, <sighs> research uncovered the fact that there was a mat. There, I did it again. There was massive damage to the house in the Trembler. Um. And that, uh, yeah, and that Sarah never fully repaired from it for, you know, from the uh, actual earthquake that took place. Right. Like after they tore everything down and, you know, fixed the damage or whatever, then the rest of it, she was just kind of like, man, fuck it. Yeah, fuck it. The stairs and doors that lead to nowhere are merely where damage has been sealed off or where landings have fallen away. After the earthquake, she moved to another house. She did not want to make the necessary repairs. It had nothing to do with the spirits. Not to mention she herself admitted that with her being the architect and having no formal training... Things often did not go as planned. <laughs> Quote, I am constantly having to make an upheaval for some reason. Winchester wrote to her sister-in-law in 1898. Quote, for instance, my upper hall, which leads to the sleeping apartment, was rendered so unexpectedly dark by a little addition that after a number of people had missed their footing on the stairs, I decided that safety demanded something to be done. End quote. Far from, far from an exercise in spiritualism, Winchester's labyrinth arose because she made mistakes. Mm -hmm. And had the disposable income <laughs> to fucking make them happen. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, basically she kept fucking up and she was like, I don't know. Here's another however much. Just yeah. fix that. Build this over here. Throw a window in there. Whatever it is. You know, it would be really cool if we could take this hallway and make it go this way and then that way and then turn around this way and come up and go over and then down again. Guy looks at him. Um, Ma'am, I, I, I don't. I don't I don't think we can just do it. <laughs> yeah. Here's ten thousand dollars. Make it happen. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, ma'am. There's an extra fifty in it if you do it shirtless. See. <laughs> I like I like the way you look. <laughs> it didn't help her reputation that she was naturally reserved. While most Bay Area millionaires were out in society, attending galas and loudly donating to charities, 
Winchester preferred a quiet life with a close family who occasionally lived with her. In the absence of her own voice, locals began to gossip, as they always yeah. do. She actually seemed like, outside of being like super smart and very rich, like she seems like she would be a really cool person. I'm telling you, I love this lady. From all the stories I've read, like everything that I was reading, doing this, like she seems like she was like super nice and just like real down to earth, like despite all the money and the whatever. And she just seems like she was like a really like good person. Yeah. Yeah. She seems awesome. Like I, I would have totally been like grandma, you know, great, 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 grandma. (laughs) One of the biggest myths, however, is the stories of how construction started and kept on going 24 seven. There were actually many instances of Sarah sending workers away. Many times in the summer months, she would send them away for a couple months because it just got too hot. And in the winter, she would send them away for a little break for everyone. This has been uncovered in Sarah's own writings. The February 24th, 1895 issue of the San Francisco Chronicle ran an article that almost single-handedly laid the foundation for the Winchester Mystery House legend. Fucking Chronicle. I know. Fuck you, San Francisco Chronicle. (laughs) Breaking news. (laughs) The San Francisco Chronicle sucks. <laughs> Quote, the sound of the hammer is never hushed, it reported. The reason for it is um, in Mrs. Winchester's belief that when the house is entirely finished, she will die. So aside from appeasing spirits with the continued building, this article states that she believes that if she ever finished the house, that's when she would die. So that's why she kept building. It's all bullshit. Bullshit. Quote, whether she had discovered the secret of eternal youth and will live as long as the building material saws and hammers last or is doomed to disappointment as great as Ponce de Leon in his search for the fountain of life is a question for, uh, for time to solve. The story concludes. Some modern day historians speculate one of the reasons Winchester kept building was because of the economic climate. By continuing construction, she was able to keep locals employed. In her unusual way, it was an act of kindness. See, again, she's just awesome. Mm-hmm. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. Quote, she had a social conscience and she did try to give a, or give back. Winchester Mystery House historian Janan Bohem told the Los Angeles Times in 2017, um, quote, this house itself was her biggest social work of all. Uh, that's, uh, that's awesome. As so far yeah, as basically they're saying that she kept people working just so they could make money and live by building parts of this house. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So she just kept them going and yeah. yeah. That's so freaking amazing. Why not? You know, to her, it's like, I have the money to pay them to do it. I'm just going to keep building the stupid house. Yeah. Back then, dude, like if you think about it, if she was worth over 500 million or okay, $500 million now, yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. And she was bringing in 30 grand a day almost. Right. At the time. Right. Like all well, today's money. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like what the fuck else are you going to do with your money at that point? It's awesome. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what, she might as well spend that money on giving people jobs. Yeah, hundred percent. That's you awesome. Know, like, she's, why not? She's freaking great. As far as all the supernatural talk, most of it started after her death. The famed Winchester Mansion fell into the hands of John H. Brown, a theme park worker who designed roller coasters. Oh yay! Don't don't yay yet. <laughs> One of his inventions, the backity back coaster in Canada, killed a woman <laughs> who was thrown from a car. Holy shit! <laughs> Oh my god. First of all, it's not funny. <laughs> Second of all, holy shit. The dude, so the dude made this roller coaster. A lady got thrown out of it and died. So they're like, well, let's move to California. <laughs> Pack the car up. So obviously after her death, the Browns moved to California. <laughs> like, Fuck this place. <laughs> when the Winchester house went up for rent, Brown and his wife, Mamie, jumped at the chance and quickly began playing That's up a fucking the old name strangest right Mamie. Yeah. Less than two years after Sarah Winchester's death, newspapers were suddenly beginning to write about the mansion's supernatural powers. Mm, yeah. There you go. Quote, the seance room dedicated to the spirit world in which Mrs. Winchester had such faith is magnificently done in heavy velvet in many colors. The Heldsburg Tribune wrote in 1924, quote, here are hundreds of clo- or clothes hooks upon which hang many costumes. Mrs. Winchester, it is said, believed that she could don any of these costumes and speak to the spirits of the characters of the area represented by the clothing. What the fuck? So, yeah, basically, like, she had uh, clothing and costumes from, like, all over the world. For different and areas. She's and she claimed that she could, like, so say she got a robe from, like, like Pakistan. She could put that on and channel the the inhabitants of that area and, like, talk about, like, like she was one of them. Pretty fucking cool. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I mean, if you could really do it. Yeah. yeah. 
It is worth noting here, there are no contemporary accounts of Winchester holding seances in the home, and Ghostland writes that the seance room was actually a gardener's private quarters. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Listen, I love getting to the truth, but some of this stuff, I was like, oh man, leave a little mystery. It does kind of bum. And yeah, it does, but yeah. hey, hey. That's what we're here for. We're here to reveal the truth. That's right. Way. The myth took hold, though, <laughs> and the home, with its dead ends and tight turns, is easy to imagine as haunted. Although the spirits are fun, the ghosts shroud the real life of a fascinating, creative woman. Winchester was, quote, as sane and clear-headed a woman I, as I have ever known, her lawyer Samuel Lieb said after her death. Quote, she had a better grasp of business and financial affairs than most men. Ooh, so stick that in your pipe, men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you like that. Girl power. <laughs> Yay. Dude, she's a badass. She's no, she just, is. She's just, awesome. She was a total fucking badass. Yeah. And, and that's so she, where she and should because, be at. Because she was so reserved and didn't get into all the bullshit and wasn't one of those, like, go out every night with your millions and go to balls and galas and fun, like, all that. She did it in her own way. And then it was just like, a fucking crazy rich lady up there. No one ever sees her. She never comes out. And you know how that shit gets started. And it's like the, the it's like the creepy guy on your street that never comes out of his house. From and, Home Alone. The, the yeah, creepy guy yeah, next door. Yeah, yeah. Dude, exactly. Yeah, it's fucked up. And see then how one shit day starts? he hits someone on the head with a shovel and you like him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Speaking of supernatural, let's get into the haunted history. Dozens of psychics have visited the house over the years and most have come away convinced or claimed to be convinced that spirits still wander the place. It was even named one of the most haunted places in the world by Time Magazine. And we all know how Ooh. awesome Time Magazine is. Correct. Right. Here are just a few tales, courtesy of Ooh. Winchester tour manager, Janan Bohem. I think it's, I think it's, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It looks like Bohem. I think it's Bame. Bem? Bame? Uh, nah, it's Bohem. Boomy. <laughs> Janan, Jan and Boomy. <laughs> Jan and Boomy. Jan and Boomy. All right. That's the name now. All right. First one here, the case of the ghostly handyman. Some of Sarah Winchester's loyal workmen and house servants may still be looking after the place. According to sightings of figures or the, quote, feeling of a presence reported many times over the years by tour guides and visitors alike. One frequent, a frequent apparition is a man with jet black hair believed to have been a former handyman. He's been seen repairing the fireplace in the ballroom or pushing an equally uh, spectral wheelbarrow, if wheelbarrows indeed linger in the beyond, <laughs> down a very long and dark hallway. Wow. He's, he's got his little ghost. The, the ghost oh. wheelbarrow. <laughs> I'm taking it with me. Sounds like a shitty Disney ride. Yeah, oh, it does. <laughs> the secret of the invisible hand. Let's talk about that one. Oh. Several years ago, a man... Wait, 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 wait. If it's invisible, how do you know it's there? It's a good question. Right. Let's find out. Oh, okay. Several years ago, a man working on one of the many restoration projects in the mansion started his day early in a section with several fireplaces known as the Hall of Fires. The house was dead quiet before tours got underway, and he was working up on a ladder when he felt someone tap him on the back. He turned to ask what the person wanted. No one was there. Ooh. Reassuring himself he'd just imagined the sensation, he went back to his work, only to experience what felt like someone pushing against his back. That was enough. He hurried down the ladder, crossed the estate, and started on another project, figuring that someone or something didn't want him working in the Hall of Fires that day. Hey, man, why aren't you working in the Hall of Fires? Yeah, you know what? Fuck you. How's that sound for me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to answer you. Whoa, yeah, whoa, I don't have to answer buddy. you. I don't have to. I don't, do I, it was supposed to get done today. That's yeah. all. You're not my boss. Okay. Uh, technically, I am. Uh, no, I uh, no, I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm, going back there. <laughs> I'm not going back there. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. Get away from me. Well, all right, buddy. Don't touch me. <laughs> A tour guide named Samantha. Oh, this is the sign of the heavy sigh. <sighs> there it is. A tour guide named Samantha recently led visitors to the room, the uh, to a room called the Daisy Room, where Sarah Winchester was trapped during the 1906 quake. Samantha was about to begin her spiel when a very clear sigh <sighs> came from the small hallway outside the bedroom door. Thinking one of her guests had merely fallen behind, Samantha turned to call the person into the room but saw no one. Then, as her eyes adjusted to the darkened hallway, she did see something. The form of a small, dark person slowly emerging, gliding around a corner. Samantha quickly stepped around the corner and again saw nothing but heard yet another deep sigh. She felt sure it was the tiny form of Sarah Winchester herself, perhaps peeved to find people in her favorite bedroom. Get out of my room, motherfuckers! <laughs> Look, bitch, I'm nice enough. 
but this is my house. All right. You can my do whatever you want. Are in there. <laughs> my, my, what do they call it? What do they call um, bloomers? <laughs> bloomers? My bloomers are in there. Don't open the top drawer. <laughs> You can find a surveillance video that seems to show a ghost or something moving around in a balcony late at night on the fourth floor. I saw this video. Yeah. Does it look? It's okay. So, <laughs> all right. You know how I love that kind of shit, right? But like watching it, it's, uh, it's taken from pretty far back. Like, and it looks like it's maybe across a courtyard or something. Okay. And you got to watch on the balcony. There's a little spot. And it literally, like, it doesn't look like it. It legitimately just looks like a person, like, walks out on the balcony, like, looks around for a second, like, wait, what? What? Oh, and then walks back. Like, you can see someone walk out and back. But it, to me, it looks like a person. But, you know, who am I? I don't know. I don't fucking know. <laughs> I wasn't there. Yeah, that's true. true. I, I am be. not super convinced that it's anything ghostly, but uh, it's a cool little video if you can watch the clip. It, it could. It, so, so. I'll see if I can find the clip. I'll post it. When you saw it, does it look? It looks like a head. It looks like you could see somebody maybe dressed in like black, and then you can see their head because the head's lighter, like white, and then it just kind of comes out, and then like it looks like it maybe looks around a second and then just walks back. So it it could be a ghost. I'm not saying it's not a ghost. I'm saying it wasn't super convincing. Oh, okay. Just as unexpected things turn up on video. The same is true of photographs. The Winchester Mystery House's own public relations coordinator reports that he took several photos of the mansion in 2015. When he downloaded the photos, he deleted what he didn't need. Okay, yeah, he deleted what he didn't need. But one caught his eye. In one window of the house, Tim O'Day spotted something. Was it a shadow, a reflection of a cloud, or something else? Now, oddly enough, I couldn't find the picture anywhere for that. I mean, you might be able to, but I, I just like Google searched it and nothing really came up. Like there's some random pictures, but I didn't find that specific one necessarily. So I don't really know what they, you know, Okay. I, it could have been someone, it could have been a shadow of someone standing in the window. Like, you never know. Just waving real happily like, hey, yeah, from, yeah. A, from a window. He's like, hey, it's a ghost. Could have been a curtain, like fucking sitting weird. Who knows, man? Could have been a crow. So that, that one I couldn't really take into contact. Dog. I, I didn't really know. Cheetah. Could have been. They do have cheetahs there. Orangutan? No, no, they don't like orangutan. She didn't like orangutan. Sasquatch? Definitely. Sasquatch. Yeah. Visitors to the Winchester Mystery House also report taking photos with strange shapes in the windows. Nice Sasquatch shirt. Perfect. <laughs> Moody's wearing a Sasquatch shirt today. Thanks to my sister for getting that to me. That's awesome. For Christmas. A few even shared their snapshots on Facebook. So if you visit, study all photos carefully before hitting that delete button. You actually never know what you might find at the Winchester Mystery House. Oh, oops. <laughs> oh, that was the wrong button. My bad. <laughs> it was uneventful. <laughs> it was. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, the way I look at this is, and of course, I'm negative Nancy about all that, you know, metaphysical shit and stuff Correct. like that. Don't Correct. believe any of that. Yes, you I do believe she was a brilliant woman. She was a philanthropist. She was just rich as shit. Yeah. You know what oh, I mean? Absolutely. And I, I think that, that uh, the, the reason that it kind of looked the way it did and whatnot when people went into it is because of that earthquake. It makes sense to me that it would right, shift You got things. a stairwell going up because they said it was a seven-story house at one point. Right, and it got You got a stairwell down going three? up that just stopped four. Four. So you got a stairway that just goes up and stops. It's it's very likely that it was like, well, the room that was up there is fucking gone now, so just put a ceiling. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? That's where I'm at on that. So it... it it really seems like that a lot of the myth is just that. It's just myth. Um, I agree with you that I, I, it seems like she was just a, a really good person all around, and she was very private. And then, like we were saying, like, you know how that goes. When you get that person in your neighborhood or, you know, the house at the end of the street that's kind of creepy, and then you don't never really see the people that live there, and it just things start to spiral man like, people's just, imagination it, and it and... starts building and building and building and it's like the game of telephone man like someone's like oh i think that that dude's kind of creepy and then it's like that dude's kind of creepy and the house is haunted and then the next person's you know it just builds and builds and builds yeah. and then i mean it's been almost 100 years since she's died so it's had 100 years to just like fester and 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 right just build onto itself yeah, it's, it's an amazing story especially about so, an amazing human being my apologies to everyone for <laughs> raining on your parade. Well, listen, we want to know what you guys think. Have you ever been there? Have you ever watched a a 
t- uh, TV show that went to the Winchester house and you were convinced by something? Do you know someone who was convinced by that? Do you think it's absolute bullshit? And do you agree that she sounded like just an amazing person? Do you know who went to the Winchester mystery house? Who's that? Bill Stoners. Yeah, I figured as much. <laughs> Zach Douchebaggins. I need that womp womp on there. Yeah. 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 Yep. Son of a I think bitch. that was recently, too. It might have been a new episode, actually. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sure he found all kinds of stuff and everyone's oh, scared absolutely. and spooky. Absolutely. Sure. Mm. I'm sure there was a demon and now he's possessed and had to have an exorcism. Freaking and... douchebaggins. Ugh. Ugh. Anyway, we Maybe want to know what you guys think. That's say. why that person was sighing. <laughs> In they... the background, they're like, oh, Ghost Hunters is here. <sighs> <laughs> just complete disdain like ah fuck ghost adventures i'm sorry ghost, ghost adventures that's okay that's what it is. so anyway we want to know what you guys think about that but listen we're not done yet because now we're going to talk about the top haunted house movies and now boys and girls it's your favorite part of the show the movie review which top 10 movies will make the cut today Ta-da. <laughs> so we're going to start off with uh, number 10 on this, and this, this is, is coming this from is a Ranker. Ranker. I, I looked on IMDb, and it was another one of those, like, uh, where you, if you Google, or Google, if you IMDb search, like, haunted house movies, it comes up with a ton of random shit. Yeah. And the same thing where, like, it's not even really a haunted house movie, but, like, it, it would take into consideration like possession movies and like just all that kind of shit if it was in a house right if someone got possessed like in a house that they that was listed as like a haunted house movie i'm like eh. okay well let's but discuss this list is a little bit better well of course you Plus picked it's this voted, list voted by people right yeah which is awesome um and of course you picked this one because number 10 obviously is the evil dead I didn't I didn't pick it because of that, but as soon as I saw it, I'm like, well, it made the top ten. I'm good yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. This but is... again, like that one's not even really a haunted house movie. Because it's the spirits come from outside and then it just happens to take place in the house. Yeah, I guess you that know? kind of does yeah, so, you're kinda of right on that one. That's from 1981, Bruce still, Campbell. Still you know, a great fucking it's movie. just an amazing movie. And it is um I and I, this is what I love about Ranker. It actually tells you what other list it's on. Yeah. And fun. this is uh number eleven of the goriest movies ever made. Ooh. It's pretty cool. And number 210 out of 550 or 41 of the greatest guilty pleasure movies. Oh, yeah. Okay. I like that. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely awesome. Uh, let's see. Number nine, The Haunting. Mm, I'm not familiar with this one. Are you? I believe that is The uh, the Haunting is a remake of The Haunting of Hill House, which is now a TV show, right? Well, this is the original. This is 1963. Oh, Okay. Yeah, so this maybe is... the haunting of Hill House was a remake of the haunting. Then it's more something like that. It's like a remake. Oh, hold on, I found it right here. Uh, let's see. The group is introduced to the supernatural through a ninety-year-old New England haunted house. Be prepared for hair-raising results in this classic horror film. Yeah, so I think I think the haunting of Hill House might have been because that was a movie before it was a series. It's a series now, right? It's actually uh, I think it's the House on Haunted Hill. Well, that's a separate movie. That's a, that's a classic movie as well. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, shit. I don't know. It doesn't say what other movies it's actually based off of or whatever. Yeah. Well, well yeah. keep going. I'll figure it out. So anyway, it's 1963. It stars Julie Harris, Claire Bloom, and Richard Johnson. <laughs> Good old Dick Johnson. Yeah. Good old Dick Johnson. <laughs> My name's Dick Dick. Anyway, uh, so that's number nine, and it is on the... It's number 324 of the best movies based on books. It's number 1,265 of the most rewatchable movies. And number 82 of the best movies of the 60s. Oh, well, you know, so nice. It's got a little clout to it. Number eight, <laughs> Beetlejuice. 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 It. Beetlejuice. If you guys don't know Beetlejuice, you, you, and speaking of which, um, what's his name? Uh, okay. So wait, that movie was called The Haunting? Yes. Okay. So there was a movie in 1999 called The Haunting that is a remake of that movie the haunting and also adapted from the haunting of hill house so it's like yeah so it's they took two movies and kind of made one movie out of it correct okay. Catherine zeta jones was in it oh liam neeson was in it nice owen wilson was in it was he like i'm gonna find you he's like look at that ghost and i'm wow. gonna kill you <laughs> wow <laughs> there's ghosts everywhere <laughs> wow so Beetlejuice, obviously, you guys know what Beetlejuice is. And Again, if you don't, not really a haunted house, but yeah. Well, I mean, it's ha- it's a house that is haunted sure. by ghosts. Yeah, I guess it, you know more so than like the Evil Dead would. Right. So, you, you know, if you haven't seen this movie, you should uh, seriously stop the podcast, 
go into another room, find a mirror, and then punch yourself directly in the fucking face. Uh, agreed. Yeah, because Beetlejuice is absolutely a classic directed by the one and only um, Tim Burton, <gasps> which... Hmm. It's actually not directed by Tim Burton. It says directed. Oh, wait, no, directed is. Oh, I'm thinking of the other one. Never, yeah, 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 never mind. Guys, slow yeah. your roll there, buddy. Yeah, 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 yeah. my bad, my we'll, bad. We'll, we'll discuss that later. But anyway, Alec Baldwin, Monona Ryder, um, it, it, um, Michael Keaton, such a freaking amazing movie. And uh, it's funny that Chad Flynn actually sent a picture over to us. Did you see it? Yeah. The, him as a cowboy. Yeah. And it says, <laughs> do you really listen to country if you yeah. don't know who this is or something <laughs> like that? Dude, I was laughing so hard. It's so great. Thank you, Chad, for that. That's amazing. Uh, so let's see. This is number uh, 529 uh, out of 1,189 of every Oscar winning film ever. Wow. It's number 529 out of, uh, yeah, 1,189 movies. That's kind of cool. Very nice. And number 22 of 314 of the funniest 80 mo- 80s movies. Okay. That's yeah. amazing. Of course. It's freaking Top Beetlejuice. Top 25. All right. Now, check this one out. Number seven. We Checking. just recently talked about this one. We did? 1408. Oh, nice. Yeah. The hotel. It's the hotel. Yeah. This is Sam Jackson, John Cusack, 2007. Basically, he is a writer that Such a good movie. tries to debunk haunted houses and haunted things. He goes to this hotel, stays in room 1408, and shit goes nutty. Uh, it's also number 13 of uh, out of 20 of horror movies that originally had much darker endings. We discussed that before. Yeah, yeah. And number 20 of 49 of the 35 great movies that blur the lines between horror and drama. Okay. That's a list. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> That's a list. Of Although, shit. wait, wait. Read that Read that again. Read that again. Um, which one? The last one? The the ranking of the uh, the last the last ranking. 20 uh, of whatever. 20 of 49. Okay. Of the 35. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't make you it up, dude. I'm, see what I'm saying? Yeah, now? that doesn't make any fucking sense. That's what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. I'm like, makes no I sense. Miss, did I mishear that? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty know. crazy. So, this one, number six um, on this list, I actually went to the theater and saw this one. Um, and I'll, I don't know if a lot of people did. It's number six on the list, so whatever. It's The Others with Nicole Kidman. Oh, I fucking hate that movie. It was weird. It it, it kind of caught me <clears throat> off guard. The twist at the end. It, the little twist at the end definitely caught me I mean, off guard. I I did kind of like that, but it was just too slow. It was me. slow as shit. And it's like a two and a half hour movie. Yeah, it was like one of those M Night Shyamalan Ding Dong movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where it just like you're going through, like what the fuck? It was. I mean, I, I liked I liked the premise and I liked the ending and everything like that, but it was just like I don't. I guess I don't necessarily hate the movie. I just like. I there's no way I could watch that movie again. There's just no way. Yeah, I would. It's so. It's so. It's a very slow burn. Like by the time I got to the end, I was just like, please, this be just be over. <laughs> and then like the last like the last like twenty minutes, I'm like, all right, that was pretty good. Well, now that we've bashed that, um, yeah. Yeah. it's uh, number one forty five of the best rainy day movies. Okay. Number six of the best movies with twist endings. Oh, what number? Number six. Of twenty four. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm Smallest. sure the other yeah. the other twenty three were in my channel one. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, let's see the uh, three ninety five of eight hundred and thirty six of the greatest chick flicks ever made. I don't really consider that to be a chick, chick flick. flick. Yeah, I don't know. If you guys don't know the movie, basically it's set in like the eighteen hundreds, and a woman and her children are Pappy in, goes in off a house. To war. Yeah, and they can't leave the house. And um, let's see. Spoiler alert: they're ghosts. They think that there's ghosts haunting their house. Right, but they're but the ghosts. They're the ghosts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now That's... that we ruined that movie and bashed it. Yep. Bam, bam. Number five, moving on. <laughs> the original, The Amityville Horror, Ooh. which is an absolutely awesome movie. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of the remake, even though... I didn't mind it. I, I, With I, I'm uh, a huge, Ryan Reynolds? Yeah. I, I, told, I didn't mind it. I didn't my wife it knows. Bad. I've got. It like was a, better than I expected. It I have be. a man crush on Ryan Reynolds. Who doesn't? Yeah, I'm silently Jesus. Anyway, okay, calm down, John. <laughs> Moody's looking at me like, "What the fuck is wrong?" Do, with I, you? do you need a few minutes? No, I'm alright. I can. I'm okay. He's a handsome man. He's a handsome man, and he has personality. I'm just, that's all I'm saying. He's, you... he's kind of the whole package. Ryan Reynolds, if you're listening, I am sorry. Yeah, well, or are you? Not at all. Okay. So the Amityville Horror, 1979. Uh, James Brolin and Margot Kidder. Margot Kidder, you know her. She went crazy. And she was Lois Lane in the original Superman movies. And she went crazy. And she did go crazy. Yeah, uh, it's basically, it's uh, based off a true story with the Amityville Horror in yeah, don't, Amityville. Don't get me started on that, in buddy. In New England or whatever it is. Don't anyway. get me started on that. <laughs> so it's number 121 out of 553 for the best 70s I think that movies. House is for sale, too. 
I think it is. It's been on for sale for like a lot lately. Yeah, and it be... keeps going down in price too. Yeah. Dude, we should buy it. Nobody wants to buy it because everyone goes looking for it. I guess they did change the windows in the front so it doesn't look the same anymore. Yeah, why don't they just charge people to come in and see the damn house? It's in like a, I guess it's in like a real quiet neighborhood. Oh, like they don't want people that. People are like, yeah. They don't want that here. It's in, over New England somewhere, I guess, because right? you know how it had the, it's in New York. It, it was in New York? It had those the, those windows in the front. They gave it like that, you know, it's textbook look there. They, uh, I, I think they took those windows out and put different windows in, so it doesn't look the same anymore from what I remember hearing. You know, uh, which kind of defeats the whole purpose. We of can't change our house. address, but let's change the I windows. I actually think they did change the address at some point, too. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's awesome. It's also number 12 of 20 of the 20 horrifying crime movies whose true stories are way more terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that one. That's Amityville Horror. Number four, Insidious. Wasn't a fan. <sighs> Wasn't a fan. It was like, eh. It kind of reminded me of every movie that came out. Yeah, they were, there was a lot of those movies coming out at that point. Yeah. They were all very similar. Like, it wasn't awful, but it was just like, all right. Yeah, man. <laughs> man. So it's, that, a good, uh, it's a good, like, waste of an hour and a half or so. Rose Byrne, Barbara Hershey, you know, it's insidious. It literally isn't on any other lists whatsoever. <laughs> it's not. But, you know, what's crazy. Neither is this next movie, which doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever. Number three, one of my favorite movies of all time, the original poltergeist oh yeah that's gotta be it's probably on so many other lists that they were just like let's just maybe not it's not on here like on yeah, anything it's, else it's gotta be 1982 craig t nelson joe beth williams coach yeah coach little girl gets sucked into a tv and <laughs> caroline <laughs> mommy come into the line <laughs> it's such a good movie and the funny thing to me is is that when i was a kid so 1982 that came out, I was six. 14, 15? Six. I was six. Seven, 16. I was six, you fucker. <laughs> anyway, so I watched this when it first came out on HBO. So it was probably like seven when it finally made it to HBO. I remember watching it and I was freaked the fuck out. Like, yeah, holy it was shit. Creepy, dude. Creepy. Especially the scene where the guy is like mm. eating his chicken and he goes in and he looks in the mirror and he starts peeling his, peeling his, face, his away. face away. Yeah. I go back and look at that oh, now yeah. and it's the worst effects. effects. Yeah, they're bad. But, oh my but God. It's a, but when I was seven years old, I'm like, oh, I couldn't yeah. sleep that night. Then yeah. you look down and his chicken's got maggots all over it and yeah. shit. So I let my daughter watch it, uh, the youngest one. And she literally looked at me like I was stupid afterwards. Because you thought you were scared? Yeah, she was like, well, this is not even like scary at all. Like, how old she? 12? She was, she's 13 now. I think she was 12 when she watched it. Right. Yeah. She just looked at me like I was absolutely in There's, some, an there's some crazy shit behind that movie, too, with, like the curses and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. People like, dying little and Little girl everything. dying yeah. and shit. Yeah, 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 all kinds of shit happened. Uh, number two, The Conjuring. Again, it came out around that same that time. A, that's a uh, Hooper did that, right? Uh, James Wan was director. Oh, who is what did he do? I don't know, <laughs> but you know, it's kind of funny though. Uh, James Wan also did Insidious, which is yeah, probably yeah, yeah. why they all kind of looked and had the same yeah. feel. He, and shit he, to he, he's done a bunch of right. So they had uh, let's see, 2013 Vera Farmiga or Farmiga, whatever, and Patrick Wilson. Uh, let's see, uh, I actually liked, I, I actually liked, uh, Insidious better than The Conjuring. I think The Conjuring movies are fucking awful. They're both whatever. Like, is that the one with the the guy with the the black face or the where he's always behind you in the films? They're that's, watching the uh, movies. That's I think that's in, that's Insidious. Right? I don't know. They're all fucking same. That's what I'm saying. I, like none of those. The movies. Conjuring was the ones with Annabelle and shit, weren't they? Maybe I mean, that shit's all the same. Yeah, movies. it is. It's it's like weird, and I'm sure we've talked about it before. But these movies run together, folks. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's uh, it says on here, why do people stop watching The Conjuring at the moment Lorraine falls through the door? Oh, so it has to be because Lorraine. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hurt, but, but Lorraine. What the what the fuck? Yeah, Insidious is the one with the dude with like the black and red face. Or okay, yeah, that one sucked. I hated that one. That was a, see, I like that one better than The Conjuring. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of that. Conjuring just bothered me. Plus, that had to do with. Uh, that was based off the story that, and it had to do with the fucking uh, people that we talked about, like way early. Uh, the husband and wife, the ghost people, fucking. That's what I'm saying. It's Lorraine and and um, why can't I think of their fucking names? They're Warrens. The, the Warrens. Warrens. Thank you. Gee, it's Christmas. And yes. I have I have a thing against the Warrens. I don't like the Warrens at all. Well, because they're shysty. I, I yeah. my personal opinion is yeah. they're, they're very, total, very much so. They're hoaxers. Yeah. Anyway, so this is number 17, check this, of 242 of the best psychological thrillers of all time. Get the fuck out of here. And the, the end of The Conjuring was okay. Yeah. Like, where they're in the basement, that was all right. Yeah, but, like, I, t to me, that was like, it's like all the other ones, man. All those fucking, um, 
those like possession fucking movies and haunted like you know what i mean like this shit's all the same and at that point when that came out they were legitimately like all the same movie and that's and what i'm like, saying i don't care yeah I'm, I'm not into them and then uh number 123 of 275 are the best movies based on true stories <laughs> 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 and number one yes it's the shining of course it is the shining the sh- <laughs> do you want to get sued <laughs> so of course you guys know the shining jack nicholson shelly duvall 1980 stanley kubrick crazy 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 ass movie um and it's just uh, amazing but it says here um it's just got it doesn't have any other lists either no then i know that one's on a bunch of lists it has so. to be it says uh oh, it's you. on to uh 16 utterly bizarre things you didn't know about the shining and fan theories about the shining we can't stop thinking about those are some other i guess articles that we're yeah articles or yeah because ranker does some articles and stuff like that too where they have that but so there you go great. yeah that's great those are your top 10 movies on haunted houses Huzzah. haunted houses so passengers speaking uh-oh of haunted houses yes well, tell the story Danny, if you're listening to this, you you should probably turn this off right now <laughs> and not listen to the rest of the episode. Amazing. I have a story that uh, that happened to me recently. This was last week. This happened, okay. And it, for those of you who've been listening for the whole for the whole duration, uh, you guys know that I am convinced that my house is haunted. All right. And some things have happened in the house that would lend to it maybe being haunted. And if it means anything, too, and I, I'm not sure if this has anything to do with it, I did go in there with a recorder right. and recorded, right. and everything was erased on its own. Correct. Every single bit of it, right. which was crazy. But anyway, so, go ahead. So I've had a few incidents, incidences, incidences. I don't know how the plural is, um, whatever. And I had I had one recently, and I, I wanted to share it with you. I figured this would be the perfect episode to share it on. It'll be quick. But uh, All right, so passengers, I hope you guys are gonna, ready for this. So I was laying, I was laying in bed, and uh, my girls were upstairs, and Danny was out in the living room, and my son was out there laying down with her, and I'm laying in bed, and I woke up at some point in the night, and it wasn't like the, uh, it, this is what creeped me out about it. It wasn't like one of those like he kind of wake up, because like a couple nights later there was another incident which turned out to be <laughs> something ridiculous. Like okay. I woke up and I was kind of like what. How was that? Did I hear something? And then the next day I asked Danny, I was like, did you hear something last night? And then she just freaked out instantly. She's like, why? What do you mean? I'm like, did you hear like a loud bang at like three or four in the morning? And then we both got up and whatever. And went, you know, she's like, oh yeah, the dog fell off the bed. <laughs> so there was that. That was the other incident. Okay. Uh, but this one, this was before that. So I was laying there and I woke up and it wasn't like that groggy wake up. Like I was dead asleep to fucking wide awake like i opened my eyes i was like what the fuck like what the hell just woke me up right okay and i started i was hearing this like weird noise it was kind of like a scraping like a, or like a like a rustling okay and i'm like the hell is that and i'm like oh it's probably just because uh we have blackout curtains in our room and they're heavier so they're right above the vent okay. and sometimes when they blow they kind of scrape on the wall okay so i'm like oh it's probably that and then i'm listening the vent wasn't blown. The, the heater wasn't on. I'm like, so I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm like, what the, the hell is it? And I thought it might have been one of my snakes because we have some snakes in there. Mm-hmm. And they like to move around at night, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'm like, the more I listen to it, it wasn't, you know, you know what the snakes sound like when they move around. Like, I know what they sound like. And it wasn't that. So I'm like, what the hell is it? And then it stopped. And I'm laying on my side facing my windows, like facing the wall, right? And then out of the corner of my eye, at the foot of the bed, I see something move along the foot of the bed. Like, right at, right above the foot of the bed, right? Like, it wasn't very tall. It was, you know, just high enough to move across the foot of the bed. And I'm like, kind of looked over real quick. I'm like, what the fuck was that? I'm like, had to have been a dog. It, like, the, my dog's tail or something. But my dogs are tall enough to where you would see them and not just the tail moving, right? Mm-hmm. Plus, we have wood floors. Mm-hmm. In my bedroom, so you hear them. So you would hear the. Yeah. Didn't hear any of that, right? So your I, dogs have wooden feet. Is that what that is? Right, they were clogs. Like they're from their Holland. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. I figured. So there was no noise for that. the The rustling had stopped. Like I saw that thing. I saw whatever it was move across the foot of my bed, and I turned, and there was nothing there. Like it was gone. So if it was a dog, I would have seen it going out the door too. 
but there was nothing and the rustling stopped right after that and i just laid there for a second and i got the fucking weirdest feeling that something was like watching me and i have no idea what the fuck it was sorry danny <laughs> <laughs> so it dude it creeped me the fuck out like normally that stuff doesn't really creep me out i'm just kind of like whoa what the hell was that right but this like legitimately because after i looked after i kind of turned and looked there was nothing there the rustling noise stopped and then like i just lay there and i was like the hell was that and like I, I went through all the scenarios in my head and like i tried to debunk it and i have no idea what it was and like that whole time i was just like i got the feeling that there was something something there like yeah. watching like looking at me feeling. like watching me it was fucking weird dude. that's crazy yeah that's what i yeah, wanted to share that with you yikes more more strange things are happening <laughs> at the moody mansion that's right man <laughs> The Moody Mystery House. Yeah, the Moody Mystery House. <laughs> well, passengers, we hope you enjoyed your ride with us on Sarah Winchester and the Winchester, Winchester. Mansion. An amazing human being, and Absolutely. hopefully you guys walk Absolutely. away with that. Uh, we'd like to know what you guys think. Do you guys she think that there's some context? A crazy kook, right? She wasn't as it, it, well. She wasn't as crazy as any. At least it's not crazy as anyone thinks she is. Right, exactly. So I think it's an amazing story, and I absolutely, I'm so glad we did this one. Yeah. Just because it was fun. a lot of people were like, oh, that house and ghosts. Well, like I said, and... like all the things that I looked at and read, like all the other podcasts that I kind of like, I like to listen to other podcasts that do the stuff that we do just to kind of hear what what they say and what they do. And I, I like to compare and try to find stuff that's different than what everyone else brings up. And it was 95% the same like almost verbatim episodes well, and there wasn't anything more there was like one episode that was like maybe two episodes that were over an hour long they were all very short very succinct and it was all this it was all the like she was crazy and built because she thought right she was, and like they didn't go into anything else and like and see, i started reading that i'm like whoa like, i think so our much passengers more to it. yeah our passengers they i, I don't know I, I firmly believe that they they they're more critical and cognitive thinking people and so they like the spooky. Of course they Except do. Except for Chainsaw. <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> but, you know, you you, the, you like the spooky and stuff, but the, I think, you know, they like to hear the... The stories are just as good, man. Yeah. Like, the real stories sometimes are just as good. Yeah, she's a fascinating human being. Absolutely. And a, a lot of people probably didn't know that she was that fascinating of a human being. I didn't. You know, no so idea. it's pretty awesome. So next week... What do we have coming up next week? We kind of touched on this person a little bit ago. We did. And uh, this is something that the folks have been asking for. Mm -hmm. And we decided to deliver. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, we're doing another another biopic mm -hmm. on our man, Tim Burton. Tim Burton. You know Tim Burton. He's a producer. He's a director. He's a writer. He's a... He does everything. He's a claymation freaking yeah. dude. So like, he's just... This one, too, is a weird one, man, because there is, like, almost nothing about this man's childhood. Really? Yes. He's an alien. I, I literally read... <laughs> so I found, like, three or four books about him online that I could read online. And uh, each one of those books is, like, the first chapter is, like, his childhood... And they're all like five pages long. He was born. I'm like, okay. <laughs> he was born. Like the, the history of that man doesn't really pick up until he like graduated college and went to work for Disney. Well, join us next week as we discuss the one and only Tim Burton. I think it's going to be an amazing yeah. time, an amazing ride. So make sure you guys are there for that. Make sure to stop over to our official website, the Midnight Train Podcast.com. At our website, you can buy some really cool merchandise, and we've got some new shit coming. I'm still working on those fecal fighter shirts. And we're still working on the fecal fighter robots. That's right. Still working on the robots. <laughs> and, of course, listeners keep asking how they can keep the steam in our engines. Well, if you like what you hear from us, consider being a producer of the show by heading over to the Midnight Train Podcast.com and clicking on our Patreon button or go to patreon.com forward slash the Midnight Train Podcast for as little as five bucks a month. You can get all kinds of cool shit, especially the bonus episodes like the Day the Music Died series and just the bantering of, of us talking about, you know, the, the the aftermath of topics or, you know, little things that we couldn't really fit into an episode. I had, an, I had an idea for one, but uh -oh. I want to get Jeff back in for a bonus episode. Okay. I want to do it. I want to do an episode of us playing Would You Rather. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you can either make up your own or find some crazy ones or whatever, but I, I'd like to play a little game of Would You Rather. I want to see... How the fuck you guys That'd think? be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah, let's definitely do that. I'm sure he'd be down to come yeah, in for that. Absolutely. So if you're a diehard Midnight Train fan, you really like what we're doing. You really think that we don't suck as bad as we think we do. <laughs> 
which go is on, a lot. You're right. Go on over and sign up for Patreon. Uh, the bonus episodes are always fun. We can get a little bit more off the cuff with it. They're just cool. And, uh, you know, and if not, if you have some commitment issues and you're like, ah, I don't know, five bucks a month, you know, it's a little bit too much. You can always leave a one time donation by heading over to PayPal.com and using the email address, the Midnight Train Podcast at gmail.com. Also, you can easily like, subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast platform. But most importantly, share the Midnight Train to everyone, please. That's all we ask of you. It takes only a couple of minutes and word of mouth is how we're going to get more passengers on this beautiful train and continue to bring you weekly episodes. We can't thank you guys enough for listening. You know how much we love you. And uh, you guys really do keep the train moving. So thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So a big fucking midnight train shout out too. good God. This list keeps hey. getting longer and longer. I'm glad it's you and not me, yeah, buddy. buddy. All right. Janet, Barbara, Craig, Lacey, Mikey, Ben, John, Nate, Tess, Heidi, Kaylin, Kevin, Samantha, Matt, Diana, Christopher, Jacqueline, Katie, Michaela, Ramsey, Tamar, Tommy Speakerbox, The Sister Skeleton. Please make sure you check the out sister. The Sister Skeleton podcast wherever not, you listen. Not The Sister's Skeleton. Not the, not that one, which it should be. <laughs> yeah. It should be. We should we should do a different one and call ourselves The, <laughs> the Sister's Skeleton. And just copy all their episodes. Yeah, and just, just copy them. Yeah, every single one. Like verbatim. <laughs> Just record them yeah. and just do everything that they did. <laughs> so make sure you guys are checking them out. They're awesome over there. Uh, also to Riley, Diane, uh, Alina, Stephanie, Julie, Laura, Cynthia, Kirsten, Dawn, Nicola, Caitlin, Chanel, Alex, Emily, Ann, Son of Vasco, Alicia, Frandapai, Danny, Melissa, Grace, Stormy, Evil, Melissa, Wayne, Victoria, Hager, Sean, um, uh, Chainsaw, not Jig, not Jigs, or because Chainsaw is it was his son that signed up. I saw up. that. Yeah, I okay. saw that. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to that. Bill, son, Colin, Todd, David, uh, Valo, Juan, Belen, Ken and Brad, Voodoo Vodka. Who, by the way, I don't know if you saw their new bottles they put out for a limited run. The Browns run. ones. The hell Browns yeah, ones. Dude. Go get over there and support the Voodoo. I wanted guys, to go man. out there and get one, but I'm never out that way. Oh, there and it's good shit. Yeah, it is really fan, good shit. Fantastic. Also, the stripper Kevin, <laughs> Davy, our Mexican <laughs> Vato, and, hey, a, Davey. <laughs> and a very very special thank you to our superhero Patreon producers Chad Flint, Sharon. Carol Pierce, Chris McLeod, Justin Kowalczyk, um, Rob Webb. Oh, by the way, get Will, Justin, uh, him and his wife, uh, they unfortunately got the COVID. No shit. Yeah. I didn't see that. Yeah. He uh, sent me a message or whatever, Aww. but they did end up ordering wings from us today for <laughs> uh, for the game today. So, <laughs> awesome, Justin, dude. I hope you get better, buddy. And Deliver thank you. it with a hazmat suit yeah. on. <laughs> thank you. I think someone else was picking it up. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, get better, man. And we appreciate everything that you guys, that you do personally. So, uh, also to Rob Webb from the Fun Box podcast. We got some cool shit that we are going to get going here with them we go kind of do that yeah man. yeah we well, have to we have to uh to Christina uh skeleton maria gibbs jessica bartolome jigsaw yeah rick resler courtney bachelor katie brabinick and bill birch and we will by the way be doing a bonus episode yeah. with this patreon producer known as bill birch oh Oh, he won the contest. He won the contest. Good for him. So Bill Birch will be coming in on a bonus episode for us, and uh, we'll be interviewing him and having him come on and talk to us. Uh, he's actually really cool. He's a former Navy guy that used to work on um, uh, nuclear submarines. I saw that, yeah. It's pretty cool. That's awesome, man. It's pretty cool. So I'm sure he's got some stories of nuclear shit. I don't know. Aliens underwater? We'll find out. I, I don't know. I'll talk to him and tell him to make some shit up. Anyway, so... <laughs> If you want your name mentioned on the show, sign up as a member on our website or become a Patreon producer. You guys have no idea how much it means to us. Seriously. So much. Yeah. So, so much. Oh, so much. So stay safe out there. Go Browns. Go Browns. Hey, by the time you hear this, we're going to be playing for the AFC championship. That's right. We, Browns. The Buffalo we got this. And if not, you guys can send us a message and find out how bad I'm crying. I'd like to know. You should record it. I will. I will. Can we have a bonus episode? It's just a half hour of you crying. <laughs> just, just, just fucking Mayfield, man. <laughs> Did you see that video of the dude from Pittsburgh? Yes, he flipped he his shit. Fucking put his ladder through his TV. That was, like, was insane. You let Baker Mayfield <laughs> do this to you. Like, fuck you. Fucking cry, anyway, baby. go Browns. Go whoever you root Woo! for, but it should be the Browns. And as always, choo choo, motherfuckers. Now go home and get your fucking shine box.